on stage, but I want to say it was probably like six or seven years ago at this point. It's been five years. Okay, five years ago, which is around the time I got into Bitcoin. So it's been around a long time. Um, it's a pretty small yet passionate community that works on it. Um, I had known it, about it for a long time, but it wasn't until earlier this year that I actually started running a Nix OS um, system that has Nix Bitcoin in it. And when I started looking into it, um, this is kind of a difficult thing to get into, as I think we'll find out today. But one of the reasons that I thought this is a thing that I think more Bitcoiners and more people in um, the Bitcoin space need to know about, and that it's something that we as builders and um, software developers in the space can really make use of, kind of has to go back to um, my experience kind of with Base58. So Base58, for those of you who aren't familiar, is a Bitcoin protocol school Basically, the idea is to teach developers, etc., about how Bitcoin works at the protocol level. Um, but one of our goals at Base 58 is to also get people into like working on software and running their own stuff, right? So when you get a lot of students that are coming into something new, the first thing that they kind of want to do is figure out what the land, what the territory looks like, right? They're strangers in a new land, or strangers in a strange land, so to speak. So part of my responsibility as an educator is kind of helping them orienteer and get their orientation into like Bitcoin. It working the first time, but good luck trying to set it up another time. You're not really sure what you did by the time it finally gets working. Um, so, you know, you're able to get it up and running maybe, but you're not really sure what you did to get there, etc. Um, sometimes you need help, so you'll call on a professional, um, but then when you're the professional and you arrive on the scene, you're like very excited to come in, but you don't always know what sort of a situation you're gonna end up on. Every person that's installing Bitcoin Core kind of has a different disaster waiting for you on the other end when they actually do come and ask for help. Um, but you know, we're Bitcoiners. We want people to be able to, oh, and this happens over and over, right? Like if when you're an instructor, people come in, they have to kind of have like the same mini problems or whatever in trying to set up Bitcoin Core um, again and again. Um, but we don't want this, right? We want people when they come into Bitcoin, when they're setting up Bitcoin Core for their first time, we want them to be like able to be successful kind of right out of the box, right? We want them to be able to have some assurance that what they're doing is going to work and they're going to be able to make it work again and again. Um, and we want them to like have some, this is Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin is money. We want to give them some assurance that what they're doing is like on a safe and secure box, right? So we want them to really understand that they're making like the best choices out of all the choices they could in terms of how to run Bitcoin Core, um, that they're doing it in a way that's going to be repeatable, um, secure, and something that they're able to kind of keep track of or update on their own without a lot of help, right? And that's where I think Bit Next Bitcoin really shines, and that's why I'm really excited about like the Next Bitcoin project. Because um, again, like when you go back to that classroom of people, um, it's not just trying to get them to run. So it's great and all that we can use Next Bitcoin to help people run secure um, Bitcoin Core installations or any amount of Bitcoin software, but it's a, it kind of goes beyond that, right? Like in the classroom setting, we're trying to get people to set up around Bitcoin nodes, but we're also hoping and through Base58 they'll become contributors and give back to the Bitcoin ecosystem, right, in terms of code. Um, and in that, like when you're trying to like build a house or bring new people in to work on these large projects, you're getting new contributors. It's really great if they're able to get onto that project and start contributing without spending a lot of time figuring out where the nails are and what wood is available, etc. Um, this is where I think like Nix as a development ecosystem, something like Nix Develop, really becomes super powerful for both getting people running their own software as well as getting them building and contributing really quickly with the minimum amount of involvement for people who are already on the project and the minimal amount of pain for new developers. So 
these are some of the reasons that I'm really excited about Nix and why I think that it can help turn Bitcoin open source ecosystem into something where um, new people who come in feel like they're already the you know king of the domain because they can run any project in Bitcoin for themselves. They can start developing for it using Nix Develop really easily and quickly. And so I'm really hoping that um, with Nix we can, as open source software programmers, developers, etc. Um, turn the Bitcoin open source software ecosystem into a place that is um, as much self-sovereign as we can get it, so to speak. Um, okay, so I know this is a big ask. Um, having people come in and have to learn a lot of things, you have to learn about Bitcoin, um, you also have to then tell everyone, okay, you, you have to learn one more thing, you also have to learn how Nix works. Um, I realize that this can be a really steep challenge because Nix is um, a functional programming like system. It's not like a paradigm everyone is super used to. There's a lot of like Nix specific, I think, ways of thinking and build doing things that you kind of have to get everyone on board with. Um, but I think that's why we're all here today, hopefully. Um, we've got a lot of experts in the room that know a lot about how Nix works. Hopefully we've got a lot of people that are new to it and want to learn about how they can apply it to their project. Um, so hopefully um, with this like shared vision, of what we're building and why it's important um, and how Nix helps us as Bitcoiners um, make not only ourselves but everyone in the ecosystem a little more self-sovereign. Um, we'll be able to achieve that through um, you know, talking and sharing what we know both today and tomorrow. Cool. Okay, so that's everything I had for my keynote address. Um, thanks again everyone for coming. Um, if you've got any questions or anything later, um, find either me or Jeff. Um, I don't really have like a great way to end this, um, but I think that's that's everything I had. Cool. So thank you. All. Cool. Um, great. So next up is going to be Pavel um, talking us about giving us an overview of the next landscape. I believe. Great. So I'm going to give it up to Pavel. Next packages, next OS, next Island, next Shell, Flakes, and all the jazz. It's going to be a little bit chaotic, but since most of us here are uh, neurodivergent, I think we should, should be able to make a connection. Uh, I believe there will be a lot of new things for uh, people that have never used uh, Nix, but also I hope there will be some new stuff for all the Nix uh, wizards uh, out there. Uh, first, let me talk about Satoshi Labs. I'm co-founder of Satoshi Labs, uh, the company who prob you probably know that was uh, the creator of Trezor, the, the first hardware wallet, but we have other exciting projects such as Unity, which is Bitcoin onboarding company, Tropic Square, aiming to deliver the first open source and auditable secure element of Excel, which is a peer-to-peer -peer application to, uh, to make it possible to trade Bitcoin with uh, your fellows in your social circle. And we at Satoshi Clouds really love Nix. We use it for our server infrastructure, uh, we use it for Trezor server infrastructure, Unity server infrastructure. We use Nix for Trezor hardware wallet uh, firmware reproducible builds. We use uh, Nix on the company laptops, uh, not only Nix OS but also on Ubuntu and Mac OS because you can use Nix on uh, basically any any platform out there and uh, just yesterday I read that uh, tweet by Hannah uh, which uh, said that uh, 
she's been learning Next with goal of creating some Next packages, but then she learned that uh, I uh, have already created all the Next packages that, I, that uh, she wanted to create. And uh, this was uh, this was during the days when we were basically Nixifying our company, and I found out that a lot of packages that are missing from the Next packages. Uh, uh, I, I, I created and since then they are there, but uh, during these days I was very active and I gained uh, commit access to Nix packages, so in case you want to get a package to, to Nix, just feel free to ping me in your uh, pull request and I will uh, make, the process, uh, make the process easier for you. And by that I'm also an indirect contributor to uh, next Bitcoin project because if there is an update uh, of any component such as Bitcoin D or uh, some writing implementation, the, the guys from Next Bitcoin project just ping me and we get uh, we get uh, the package updated in the next packages so we don't have to have local modifications in Next Bitcoin project. So yeah, if you are contributing to Next Bitcoin as well, and uh, I think there will be more contributors, feel free to ping me as well in the pull requests. But yeah, I'm talking about Nix, but some of you don't really know what it is, so... Uh, Nix is a purely functional package manager, which is using a custom lazy functional programming language. Uh, custom uh, means that it's not something you've probably seen, but since uh, it's functional programming language, it kind of might remind you of, uh, of Haskell or uh, some other programming language, and lazy. It means that expressions are only evaluated when they are needed, uh, not when they are encountered. So this has some really nice uh, properties. I don't know how to scope of this talk, but uh, it's good to know uh, that the, 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 this programming language is lazy and functional. Uh, another thing is... Uh, sorry. You're okay. <laughs> another thing is that uh, Nix does not follow FHS, which is file system hierarchy standard, uh, which says that executables should be put in slash bin, slash user, slash bin, and libraries in slash lib, slash uh, user, slash lib. Uh, it rather puts uh, packages in a slash nix slash store, uh, and uh, to be more exact, there you can see the path uh, here uh, on, the, uh, on the bottom, which says slash nix slash store p 6 GV, blah blah blah, Firefox 331 uh, slash bin or slash lib. And th this identifier is a cryptographic hash of uh, the package builds dependency graph. And also, uh, what's different from all other distributions that follow FHS is that the binaries have R coded error paths in, bi uh, in binaries. Uh, which means that the binary is looking uh, for its libraries in a certain positions and the FHS distributions try to avoid that because they want uh, binaries to look in the standard uh, uh, locations. So, for example, in this example, this uh, Firefox binary has hard-coded uh, uh, absolute paths to its libraries which are stored also in the uh, Nix store. So we won't use the system uh, system uh, libraries. Well, what does this bring? Uh, you have complete dependencies, so you are not uh, dependent on libraries that are outside of the Nix uh, ecosystem. You have multi-user support, which means that uh, multiple users can use Nix on the same machine, but also this brings uh, uh, the feature that uh, not only different users can have different versions of the same package installed, but also single user have, has access to multiple versions of the same package. So I can have Firefox 32, I can have Firefox 150, and I can use them uh, at the same time, basically. Which is not possible uh, in other uh, distributions following FHS. Okay, so uh, let's, let's dive in into more practical examples. Uh, there is a command link channel, uh, which uh, you can, you can uh, use to show what channels you are subscribed to. This is how it looks on my uh, computer. So I'm subscribed to Nix Packages Unstable uh, uh, channel, because I like living on the edge and uh, it's a, this channel is uh, used under the LSNix packages. But yeah, like 
Well, what, what are mixed packages? So let's make a short uh, intermezzo about mixed packages. Uh, mixed packages are <laughs> mixed packages. Uh, it's a set of mixed expressions uh, packaging software. It's the world's largest uh, software collection. And it's available not only for Linux, but also Mac OS, BSD, Windows, uh, and other platforms. Of, of course, if there are some Linux-specific packages, uh, you can run them on Windows and BSD, but, uh, uh, but I would say like half of the packages are working on non-Linux OSs as well. And this is the chart uh, from Repology, uh, which you probably don't see really well, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, let me check how do I turn on this uh, cursor in the Doesn't matter. So uh, on the top right corner, there is mixed packages unstable, which contains more than 87,000 uh, packages in the repository. That's the x axis. And uh, more than 57,000 packages are fresh. That means they are up to the latest version uh, released by upstream. And uh, as you can see, like by far, that's, that's the most of any other software collection out there. And uh, the only contenders are Mixed Packages Stable, 3305, released in May. Uh, Mixed Packages Stable, 2211, released uh, in November last year, and so on. And uh, the only outlier in this cluster is OUR, which is uh, ARC uh, Linux uh, users' repositories. But all other uh, software collections are here. Uh, leading the pack are FreeBSD ports, and uh, Debian, Ubuntu, and all other forms of Debian. But as you can see, there are still like maybe uh, only 40% of uh, software packages in this repository. So mixed packages are really, really uh, a huge uh, software repository. And uh, this is how a mixed expression uh, for packaging software looks like. If you have ever done packaging for any distributions, you know there are uh, like five most important things uh, to tackle. So the first is where to obtain sources. Here in mixed packages, you use fetch URL, for example, or fetch GitHub to fetch from uh, from GitHub. You provide an URL. Then you also provide a cryptographic hash. This is very important because there's not only checks for integrity, but also it results in uh, all builds being reproducible because you commit to a certain hash of the sources. Uh, then, in uh, using build inputs, uh, you list a uh, list of basically a list of dependencies uh, that you need in order to build. So, in this case, for building GLX, GLX info, we need libxy, uh, x11, and libgl. And then, uh, in this build phase, usually you have three phases, uh, configure, uh, build, and install. So in this particular package, we don't have configure script, so we just use don't configure to, to skip it. Build phase, it, it's basically a shell script that does the build. Install phase, it's a script that does the installation. And uh, here on the bottom, we have meta data area, which basically says, what the package is, who is the maintainer, what's the license, and which platform is, uh, uh, is supposed to be run. So, uh, it looks maybe more like a JSON, if you are not familiar with uh, some functional languages, but I think that's, that's, a, that's a good feature. But even if you don't know all that crazy uh, mathematics uh, behind uh, how the functional language works, you can just use this recipe uh, without understanding all of this, which is very helpful in getting more of people contributing to mixed packages. Okay, end of mixed packages in Terbezo. And back to the examples. Uh, in Nix enabled system, we also have Nix Elf uh, uh, program binary, which will list uh, the list of, uh, if you if run with minus Q command, it will list the, the packages uh, that you have installed or Nix packages, people prefer to call it the derivation. <laughs> and uh, on my system, I have Nix uh, and NSS CSR, which is dependency containing uh, certificates. Uh, and uh, I can install a new package 
according mix and minus uh, i capital A mix packages dot fish so that says hey from mix packages channel install this fish package and as you can see here uh, it is copying path slash mix slash store eight four G blah 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 fish three five one from cache mix or and building some user environment whatever that means we'll get to that later uh, so there was this mention of cache NixOS org. This is a really cool feature about NixOS. Since all packages contain the cryptographic hash of the used inputs, you can very effectively uh, cache them. And all packages built by Hydra, which is the NixCI, are cached on cache NixOS org forever. So if there is anybody else on the world who has built the same input configuration, that means same uh, sources, same configure script, same install script, same uh, build script, uh, then it, you might as well not do the build, but just uh, download the result from the cache. Of course, this is optional, uh, it's opt out, so you can use a certain switch to not use the cache and build everything from scratch, but of course for regular use uh, it's just more same to, to use this cache. And it's cached there forever. I'm not really up to date how it is now, but I think like three years ago when I was last time on Nixcon, it was still the case because Nix uh, had a had a funding uh, from from some cloud provider, and they get basically infinite amount of this space. So they were still like cache binaries like from I don't know ten years ago, which is really amazing. If if you want to build NixOS from Five years ago, uh, you can you can do it, and uh, the, the things that has already been built will be done. Yes. So when the command is finished, uh, you can use uh, which fish to see the fish is really installed, and it's installed is in slash user stick mix profile bin fish. And since I have added this path to my uh, environment path, I can just uh, type fish to run fish. Uh, okay, let's explore more into the details what this user's Nix, uh, user stick Nix profile is. So it's similar to Nix var Nix profiles per user stick profile. Okay, this is a similar to profile twenty two link in the same location. All right, and this is a similar to Nix store Jam X sixty six user environment. Ah, I have seen user environment earlier. So when every time when I install a new package or uninstall a package, a new user environment is created and uh, my profile is being symlinked to the new uh, environment that was just created. And this environment contains all the binaries, all the libraries my environment use, uses. So I have this fish symlink to Nix store, blah blah blah, fish. Nix uh, is a uh, sibling to Nix store, Nix, uh, and so on. And basically, it's just one sibling magic, right? And because siblings are atomic, this really makes a uh, really great tool for making atomic upgrades and rollbacks. Because for, for whatever reason, if I want to go back to my earlier configuration, I can just change the symlink is the same thing as uh, uh, mix and does the symlink when it, when it changes the environment forwards I can go backwards so it's very easy and also there is a garbage collection uh, which I can get by running this mix call it garbage which removes all unreachable stuff from mix store so if, if there is a some mix store package there but it's not reachable from any any user environment uh, of any user, it will just get uh, removed. So this is also that you uh, have to bear in mind, like if you ever run out of disk space, which is very easy with Nix, you should try to run uh, uh, this command before trying to, to do anything else. Because everything is just there until you delete it explicitly. Okay, so uh, this was the Nix and example. But also, you might want something more 
ephemeral, more temporal. Let's say you want to experiment with fish and exit command, but you don't want to really clutter your user environment. You don't want to, to have it installed uh, forever on your system. You just need to uh, try whether fish is uh, the right thing for you. So we can just use nick shell minus p uh, fish exec. And what happens here is that packages are installed in nick store, but no user environment is created. Uh, it's uh, nick shell just runs a shell and overrides your path to include uh, uh, paths to all of these binaries you're going to be using. So it looks like an environment basically for you from any practical perspective. But if you exit the shell, the environment is just gone because it, it is never existed in the first place. Yes, by yes. is gone, you mean is eligible for garbage collection? Yes. Okay. Uh, the question was if, if, if these are eligible for garbage collection, and uh, exactly like uh, uh, since there is no uh, user environment pointing to that uh, binaries uh, by the time by the time you exit this nick shell, these are all eligible for garbage collection. And this is also the number one reason how to clutter your nick store. <laughs> so uh, if, if you experiment with some really huge dependency tree. It might be a good idea to just mix collect garbage uh, right after using this machine. Okay, but typing uh, all this uh, on a command line uh, once you know that your project requires uh, certain uh, dependencies is uh, awkward. You might as well use uh, a shell nix file, which can look something like this. And uh, again, it's an expression uh, where you use build inputs uh, attributes to, to uh, provide a list of packages you want to install. But on top of that, you can, for example, use shell hook to, uh, to describe a script that should be run when entering this shell. And if my folder contains a, script, a shell nix file like this, and I type nix shell without any other attributes, uh, parameters, it will install all the packages and will input, runs the shell hook and put me in, a, in, a, in, a, in the shell. This is really great for basically describing your development environment of such project. But this approach has one drawback. Uh, there is, uh, since there is no indication about versions you are going to be used, and Nix packages basically refer to whatever instance of Nix packages user is uh, currently using on their system. There is no reproducibility, so uh, you can use this trick. Uh, you don't use uh, Nix packages like this in, in the brackets. Uh, you configure it explicitly and say, "Hey, I want Nix packages to be this tarball downloaded from uh, from GitHub from this particular GitHub revision. Here's the cryptographic hash of the downloaded tarball, and this is the Nix packages I want to use." And uh, this is the approach we've been using for Trezor for a very long time because it's basically like pinning to a certain uh, revision uh, of Nix packages. And uh, this brings you the reproducibility, of course. Uh, however, there is new approach to tackling this, the same problem and it's called Flex. And uh, the idea is well, let's not use the shell mix file, let's use a flake that mix file, uh, which looks like this. I mean, it might be a little bit overwhelming and complex, but uh, the bottom line from this slide is you can do basically the same things, things uh, that you will do in shell mix file. So you can, you can uh, list uh, some build inputs, you can have uh, OS specific build inputs, for example, on on uh, Darby, and you might want to include all accelerate frameworks and so on. Uh, you can have post install scripts and blah blah blah, the jazz. And uh, yeah, uh, it behaves in many ways similarly to, to Shellnix uh, file. But uh, the difference from the Shellnix is there is a flag.log file. So basically, you can use Nix flake in it to initialize the flake in your directory. Uh, then you figure out the flake Nix file, what you should uh, put in there. And then you can uh, run Nix flake lock. 
to generate a log file which basically says, okay, so, so this input, uh, let's log this to this certain revision that is available at this moment, and the, the other input, let's log it to uh, this particular version. And uh, it, it generates a file like this. It's small, uh, you can probably read it, but it, it, it's a JSON that says, hey, we have mixed packages input, uh, let's use uh, this and that revision, this is the cryptographic hash of the revision used. And basically that's a little bit more cl uh, clean approach because all these cryptographic hashes that are pinning to certain revisions are stored in a flake uh, log file. And if, uh, if you want to update all the dependencies, you can just call next flake update to get all of these updated. I saw that there's a type GitHub. What are the other competing types that are available? Uh, URL and like Exactly, exactly. Like uh, you, you can fetch from GitHub, you can fetch from Tarball, you can fetch from whatever other uh, version system out there. You can also set up your own local repository. Yes. So uh, once you have a Flag uh, Nix and Flag log file in place, you can uh, use Nix run to run uh, binaries built uh, in that environment, but also you can run Nix develop. And uh, this is also another nice feature of uh, Nix Flag. Basically, you can define two different environments. Uh, one environment is used for running your project, and other environment is used for building your project. One good example might be when building an Android app, you probably don't want to uh, you don't want to install all crazy Android SDK in a running environment. While one only thing you really need for running it is maybe you know just just, just the small uh, binary that uploads uh, the the phone, the the binary uh, APK into the phone or something like that. Okay. Uh, but also another feature of Flake is, if you look here at the bottom, you can define different application entry points. So, for example, here we have uh, entry point for Llama, which is basically let's run bin Llama from uh, uh, from the out from the output uh, tree, or uh, x quantize uh, let's run the binary quantize from the output. Three and by, by the way, this is uh, the Flake Nix uh, file from my uh, favorite project, uh, Lama CPP, which is a C++ implementation of uh, of uh, a large language model with the same name. And uh, with that, uh, you can you can use uh, commands like this. So Nix run is basically the same as running Nix run dot, which says, "Hey, I'm look in the current directory." Figure out if there is a Nix file and, and run whatever the default program is. Uh, it's also defined here. It's apps default equals uh, self apps uh, llama. But you can also override it by using nix run uh, dot hash llama. It's doing still the same thing. But if you run nix run uh, dot hash quantize, it will run a different binary uh, from, from the output tree. And this is very useful for projects that have different uh, binaries. But I mean, th this is nice, but not as cool as using this. So what you can do is uh, you can replace dot with uh, identifier, which can also be a remote one. For in this particular example, you can run nix run github colon gergenov uh, slash uh, llama cpp. And it's basically doing the same thing as checking out the, the jigger kind of Lama CPP tree locally and running mix run in the git checkout. Uh, of course, this works only and on, uh, only if uh, upstream uh, edit flake makes and flake for the flake block files into their uh, git repository. But 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 once you do this. Like this is everything that a user needs to do. Like they, they don't need to know anything about uh, your project, about Git, about uh, building it. You just run Nix, run GitHub uh, identifier, and it's done. And of course, you can override the library. The library, uh, sorry, the binary you want to be using. So it's either Lama or Quantize in that particular example. Okay. What do we have next? Uh, NixOS, it's a Linux distribution based on Nix. Uh, 
they are really keen on uh, not uh, uh, using non inventive cure syndrome, so they are using system D, uh, they are using vanilla packages, so that means no crazy modifications or GNOME or whatever, they try to stick to upstream as much as possible. And this also applies to patches, so for example, if you want to patch some package locally in X packages, they will say, hey, we don't want patches here, maybe just send a pull request to upstream and then let's uh, fetch the patch uh, from, from the remote, it is probably GitHub, uh, and use it from there. Uh, which, which is really nice uh, motivation of uh, making changes upstream and not, uh, not uh, having a lot of patches uh, downstream which is my main uh, pet peeve with uh, Debian because they have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, downstream patches. Uh, but uh, it's not only about package management, uh, you can also use Nix for system configuration and mostly you have two files, uh, BTC Nix, configuration Nix and hardware Nix. So uh, I won't go into the details, again it's an Nix expression and basically there uh, you can say let's install these packages, for example curl, git, sqlite, blah blah, let's start these services and let's have this, uh, this user, this group, let's set the time zone to Prague, firewall, uh, and so on. And uh, this is basically what Nix Bitcoin does, they do really very good job of integrating uh, all Nix, uh, Nix packages, uh, packages <laughs> into, uh, into one, uh, one uh, distribution that works really well and everything is pre-configured in a way that it really makes sense. And also uh, the hardware Nix file uh, things it says, yeah, let's still use group as a loader, let's use these uh, kernel modules, let's use this looks device, uh, let's limit the number of parallel jobs to four because I know I have four physical cores and st stuff like this. And again, like every time you make uh, a change to this uh, configuration, you can run NixOS rebuild to rebuild your NixOS configuration. And it behaves the same way as I have shown you earlier in the next end. So it's the similar magic. And if something goes bad, you can go to earlier configuration very, very easily. Uh, in, in a graph example, uh, you, you have this list of uh, configurations that you can choose from. And that's uh, one of the reasons why I'm really not afraid to use unstable uh, packages uh, on the production machines. Because first of all, unstable doesn't mean it's broken, because unstable pack, uh, channel only gets updated if uh, the CI says yes, the core packages work. And uh, the other thing is, if I am able to full bar my machine for whatever reason, I can just go to earlier uh, configuration for that matter. Of course, it can get a little bit tricky if, for example, the GNOME uh, is updated in the process and updates their configuration files in a way that they are not backwards compatible. But hey, you don't run, you don't run the GNOME on your server anyway, right? So on the server it's fine, on desktop it can be a little bit uh, tricky because you have these uh, so-called impure elements outside of this really nice functional uh, rainbow world. And maybe Home Manager would help you. Yeah, there, there are two, there are tools uh, for that as well. But I really didn't want to make the talk uh, really long. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, Peeling the, the onion, uh, you can put another level on top of that uh, NixOS thing. So, uh, Satoshi Labs views Morph, uh, which is the NixOS deployment tool. Uh, it's uh, developed by DBCDK, which is, uh, uh, I think it's from Denmark. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a public library from Denmark, and they, they were using that for a very long time. And it's basically a fancy wrapper around Nix build, Nix copy, and Nix and it's very, very basic but very effective. It has, uh, it has also health checks. And uh, what you can do here is basically 
create another top, uh, another layer on top of Linux OS configuration. So you can de define different machines. In this example, we have a we have a web server and a database server, and uh, you can uh, you can basically describe your infrastructure uh, in in such way. Uh, of course, if you have like several hundred servers, you don't really want it to, to do it like this because then your uh, MorphNix file will be really, really long. Uh, so we, we use uh, a best practice described uh, in Morph. So basically, you can have uh, modules, roles, hardware, profiles, and infra. And the idea is modules are basically uh, like system the units, units uh, defined in uh, Linux packages. So it can be LND, Bitcoin, D, and other stuff. Uh, or it can be flakes, so for example, elements. And uh, these are the modules you want to use. Then there are roles. Uh, role can be, for example, uh, authentication server, where you combine uh, different uh, modules and some secrets. And once you have this logical description of your uh, of your machine, you can then uh, uh, use some hardware configuration which says let's deploy this to OVR or to VPS, let's use a physical machine, blah blah blah. And then uh, the profile is basically a combination of this role, which is logical description, hardware, which is physical description, and a health check. So basically this defines an instance of the machine, and then infra is basically just a list of uh, machines. And uh, if you do any, uh, any, any modification, you can just type more deploy and everything that has been changed will be rebuilt and uh, pushed via Nix uh, copy to your remote server. Uh, that said, Morph is very nice because it doesn't really deal with provisioning, so you need to have all your servers provisioned. All it, can, all it can do is push the contents to this already existing uh, server, which I prefer because uh, that way we can uh, we can use uh, Terraform or any other uh, cloud provisioning tool. And but there are other approaches such as uh, NixOps, which can also do provisioning for you. Uh, and also there are some other deployment tools such as Crops, uh, which should be similar to Morph, but I haven't uh, used it very much. Uh, I know that it's used mostly by Nix Bitcoin guys. And uh, there is also Colmena, uh, which is also similar to Crops and Morph, but is written in Rust. So, you know, everything has to be written in Rust these days. So, yeah. And uh, last but not least, there is also a project called Quix. It's a uh, Nixos inspired uh, GNU Linux OS by the GNU project and it uses uh, a real scheme which should, which should have been a uh, uh, GNU real skill, sorry, instead of Nix. Uh, that means uh, several things. Uh, the, the, the number of packages is much, is much smaller than Nix packages because everything needs to be reverted in real and also there is no proprietary stuff there which might be an issue for some, but not for others. You can learn more about uh, this project in Wix.org and uh, also there is a bootstrapable project which tries to build like, the whole uh, Linux distribution basically from uh, several lines of assembly and everything on top uh, is being audited, which is, which is really good for uh, Building uh, binaries such as Bitcoin from uh, as many uh, uh, as low uh, number of uh, trusted uh, source lines as possible. Uh, I think there is uh, we have uh, Carl here uh, who is an expert in GUIs. So uh, if you want to talk about GUIs with him, uh, I think he's the best guy here. And uh, this is how uh, this uh, dual scheme expression uh, works. There are a lot of uh, brackets involved, uh, and uh, again, like it, it, it's more mostly the same uh, structure as Linux packages, but written in a, in a different way. Uh, yes. Very lispy. Yeah, scheme is basically uh, better uh, lisp. Okay, uh, I know this was really a lot to process. Uh, I wanted to make uh, it uh, as wide as possible, 
and uh, not really boring. So I only cherry picked uh, uh, things I do think are important, but I might have omitted something. There are these uh, resources I recommend uh, you to see. So Nixos uh, work uh, slash learn it, it's a really good uh, uh, you know uh, starting point. Uh, there there is a document called Nix Pills, which uh, are really hands-on practical guides. There is a Nix Dev project that's uh, trying to uh, also become like a go-to platform. Uh, for developers, and of course there is this course. Uh, feel free to ask anything there. The Nix uh, Nix community is very active on their forum, and of course uh, there is GitHub.com slash Nixos, and uh, there is Nix packages repository there and others. So, yeah, uh, I hope this was helpful and not very confusing. And uh, yeah, see you, see you on GitHub, I guess. Remind me what you're talking about. It's gonna be great. Um, I think it's trust among enemies. Um, great. So this is Julian, um, who will be talking about how Nix helps us trust or not trust our enemies. Um, so let's welcome Julian to the stage. All right. Good morning, everybody. software, the transparency of our software builds. Um, so you're going to have a lot of talks today about uh, how things work, different tooling and Nix. Um, this talk is going to be a little bit more high level and then we're going to talk about the things that are possible once you take the whole Nix bill and you uh, adhere to this kind of model of uh, building and distributing software. Um, so you know, probably give us a great like uh, walkthrough of like the Nix ecosystem. One thing I think you didn't mention is that Nix is really good at binary caches. So we talk about the Nix packages in Tormezzo. Um, we have this cache called Nix OS that provides all these Nix packages, and they all come from a GitHub repository. Um, so you can use these recipes to build them, and they're distributed via a cache that we all use. Um, we have to trust this cache, and in that sense, that's no different than any other package manager we use. Um, so. The TrustX project is something that came out of the Nix ecosystem over the last couple of years, kind of taking all these primitives that, that Nix gives us and tries to think about how we can make it radically transparent which packages we're getting uh, in adversarial environments. Um, you, you know, sometimes you might think this is a bit of a solution looking for a problem, um, but I don't think this is like a, a diss at all for this project. I think they really took the ideas that Nix gives you and um, took them through a full logical conclusion. And I think this is kind of a problem set that we're going to have in Bitcoin, right? We're going to have to be radically sure that the cryptographic software we're using uh, is the one we expect and that we are operating in an adversarial environment when it comes to the packages we're sourcing. Um, and yeah, so we should probably try solving this problem sooner rather than later. So um, before I tell you more about kind of how Trustix solves this problem, um, what's the problem we're trying to solve, right? The problem is that as with Bitcoin and as with most things, um, trusted third parties are security holes. Um, if you've used PIP or NPM or any package manager for your preferred uh, language of choice, you're most likely just hitting PIP install and running it and calling it a day, right? And you're assuming that it's a package you expect and that's really it. And this is how most software in the world works. Um, from a security standpoint, this is kind of uh, not so great, right? You're obviously, you can, 
you know, NPM every other week has a story of malware that got into the NPM ecosystem, right? Because of that signature, because they got malware or whatever. Um, you know, Nix offers us some really good ideas to to mitigate this, right? We talk a lot about uh, we talk a lot about reproducibility, um, meaning that you know, if you have a given set of inputs, you can verify that the package the binary cache is giving you is the package you expected. You have this nice cryptographic signature that validates everything that went into this package, and you can be quite sure that what you're getting is the package you expected. You still have to rebuild it locally. Yeah, it's Sorry? You could get a reproducible security hole. You could get a reproducible security hole, exactly. Um, so yeah, there are a lot more problems here we can have, right? So if um, you know the next package cache was somehow uh, backward in such a way or they changed the inputs for a package, you may not notice, right? Unless someone is checking all the reproducibility of the packages that are provided. Um, and even also typo uh, squatting. Uh, also typo squatting, yes, so could do that. The big problem. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't know how that fits into the, the next packages, but yeah, you can, that's true. This type of package, you know, somebody creates a new package, but it's a typo and it has the backdoor in that. Anybody who does the same typo ends up very reliably getting exactly the same derivation that you got. Right, right. So if someone submitted a package that has like one letter off from the package you expect, uh, and everyone starts downloading that, you'll be downloading a malware package, right? This is also true in mixed packages, right? Um, also, it would be pretty hard to see if the Nix package's signing key was compromised. Because of the way that the Nix package cache works, it's actually really hard to swap out the signing key and uh, still be able to validate all the other packages that are supplied to the Nix packages. Even worse, if the hardware that the Nix packages, packages were built on was hardware that was uh, backdoor, you wouldn't know this either, right? So as much as like reproducibility is a uh, something that is a unique selling point to Nix and something that I think is a really good asset for open source development and security in open source development, it's really not uh, a panacea and there's a lot of other um, problems we need to be able to address. So, um, taken from the docs, I should my screen, but uh, Trustix is a tool that compares build outputs for a given build input across a group of independent providers to establish trust in software binaries. Um, so the only idea with Trustix is that if your packages are reproducible and you know this, um, what you can do instead of trusting one cache is that you can simply trust many of them. Um, instead of having one single builder you trust, have an arbitrary number of builders and then compare the build outputs of uh, many of those builders. That way, what you're doing is that you're forcing someone who is trying to uh, alter a package, alter a reproducible package, to kind of show themselves, right? If you assume that a certain number of the builders are acting in good faith, then it'll be easy to detect ones that aren't. Um, if this sounds kind of conceptually simple, it's because it really is. Um, but I think you, this gets us kind of very far ahead in terms of uh, having an ecosystem, especially in an adversarial environment where you may not trust all the people supplying your packages. Um, it gives us a, a, it really slows down our, it limits the attack surface that people can have on the packages we're getting. So what does this look like, right? You might be a client um, and you'll have multiple builders. What you'll do is that you'll, uh, these builders will be building packages, let's say they'll be building Bitcoin D. Um, they will be providing the hashes of that build that they provide. If the package is reproducible, they're all going to be producing the same hashes. And you can decide um, what your metric of trust around these builders are. For example, um, for Bitcoin D or something that's, that's quite sensitive, you might say that uh, I want 10 out of 10 of the builders I'm listening to to provide uh, the exact, the correct hashes, right? If it's something that maybe you're less worried about, you can say, okay, maybe I'm just going to run um, six out of seven, or you know, two out of three, or twelve out of seventeen. Entirely up to you, right? So um, you're observing these various builders; they're providing hashes, and you get to design your trust view on uh, the packages that are provided, right? So this is basically what Trustix makes possible, right? It uh, gives you a client uh, on your MixOS machine to listen to multiple builders that are also running Trustix and providing these build logs to you. And you listen to whichever builders you want and you configure your trust metric in any way you see fit, right? Um, I like this a lot and I think this is a pretty great idea because it forces, uh, it, it, 
we're bringing all the, the malicious actors onto our terrain, right? They have to undo a reproducible package that we define as reproducible, right? And I think this works quite nicely. Um, you know, I think a, a decent analogy might be that, you know how Noster, uh, some of you are familiar with how the Noster relay stuff works. You have a client listening to multiple relays, blasting information, and it's redundant across those relays for uh, a certain person's, where they're publishing their messages to. And then you set a filter over those relays for the, amount of, for the specific type of information you want to receive as a client. Well, in a similar way, uh, you have a client who's listening to a bunch of builders, and you place your filter on the amount of trust that, and which packages you want to listen to and the amount of trust you want to have, um, and the success of those builds in an arbitrary set of builders. Cool so far? Yes, sir? Why would you ever choose something that has uh, two out of ten or three out of ten? I mean, it seems like one difference is enough to raise this question. Yeah, so the question was, uh, why would you ever choose 2 out of 10 or 3 out of 10 or a degraded set of uh, trust for a given package? Um, well, one answer might be that uh, uh, it's difficult. Like, reproducible, reproducibility isn't always perfect. Sometimes there are transient errors. Maybe it's, um, you know, I mean, this happens a lot even with Nix, right? You can go into the Nix package's uh, issue repository, and there's packages that have kind of transient errors around reproducibility, or this package isn't fully reproducible, and we can't really find out why. Um, building software is difficult. Um, of course, like, the goal is obviously to get every single package at full reproducibility, so that, and the goal there would be, and so first of all, yes, I agree with you, you always want to get as much, uh, you almost would never want to download a package that has three out of 10 builders, especially if, I wouldn't even want to nine out of 10, right? Always want a 10 out of 10 for the say uh, 2 out of 10 reproducibility. Yeah, so you always want it at 9 out of 10 reproducibility. Um, and I, I would agree. I would agree. Um, I can think of a context. Okay. If, if one is using the same, in, one's internal environment, and one has several styles of machinery set up to do the build, you might be testing in that context uh, that um, this machine has a lot of memory built, so this one has only been provided a moderate amount of memory. You might be. It might be that some of the builds would crack because they didn't have enough resources. Yeah, but that shouldn't affect the artifacts, the output. This check some of the artifacts. Does this check that sort of thing, like some sort of combination with CI, or is that it didn't produce the same thing? Which very much I would kind of agree. It isn't producing the same thing, and it produces something I am frightened that it will not run that code. Right, so if the build crashes, it wouldn't be published or available, period, right? So, like, are there, uh, yeah, differences in the environment you're running it in if you're using it for an internal environment versus an external environment? Um, yeah, there may be, but it shouldn't affect the build. Like, the whole point of building with Nix is that it's an actual sandbox and that if that build is reproducible, then you're going to have the same output regardless of uh, the method or size of machine on which you run it. Uh, so, ideally, that wouldn't be a problem, I would hope. Excellent question. So that was, um, is there a mechanism in Trustix to uh, try to track builders and view kind of whether they're being malicious, where they started being malicious? Um, and there is, right? Uh, so um, Trustix has a way of, of tracking each builder and their history and how they deviate from the global package that, that you're following. So um, to, to your point earlier, like if we get to an open set of builders, you can track one of them that has only that is continually trying to mess with the Bitcoin D binary, and you can blacklist them or stop listening to them entirely as a builder, right? Uh, it gives you those kind of ways to, to, and this is really like the whole point is like making it show the enemy, make them show themselves, right? Make show when a builder is trying to mess with a reproducible package, uh, and that's what that makes possible. Yes. Uh, would any, would all of the packages available in Nix pack packages be a 10 out of 10 reproducible type? Yeah, so um, the, the question was, um, like, what percentage of Nix packages are actually reproducible? I believe it's somewhere around 96% last time I checked. I think it floats between 96 and 98%. Um, and 
if, if it was 100%, would this project be useless? Um, no, because the Nix package, you're still depending on the Nix OS cache itself as an individual cache. And that cache can be backdoored. Like, it's not just because reproducibility is not the only thing that matters here, right? You would actually not know if the hardware or the signing key uh, or even the inputs of new packages were, uh, were altered in the Nix OS cache today. Right? Reproducibility is great, but I don't think that every single package you download from Nix packages, you're rebuilding yourself to verify the reproducibility of it. Right? Um, so, yeah. But also, like, the second interest in, in moving away from a single cache is that um, you give, you, you force someone who's trying to mess with your software supply chain to go and chase a hundred, a ten dozen, hundred thousand different builders around the world and not just one. Right? And that buys you a lot of legroom. Uh, can you see the difference in uh, the build logs between something malicious and something not? You can't, right? The only metric you're looking at is what the, the build logs that are published and uh, what, what the hash was. That's it. So all, like the, your metric is simply comparing to other people. So in that sense, it's quite arbitrary. But I would argue that you know, in, if the packages are reproducible, then uh, even an error that deviates from reproducibility can be malicious. Like, you shouldn't have to tell the difference. In fact, something that is a mistake m may be malicious, and you should consider it as malicious even if it's a mistake. You know what I'm saying? I think that's like a, a cool thing that Nix uh, allows us to, to get to. Cool, love these questions. Thank you, guys. Um, so, so, yeah, so if... Uh, if packages are not reproducible and every builder is just, you know, coming out with different hashes for every single binary, this obviously isn't very helpful, right? Like, we have to start with actual reproducible packages. Um, but what it does do is give us a sense of, like, which packages aren't reproducible, um, which obviously wouldn't be super helpful. But if packages are reproducible, it allows you to observe these, these differences and detect them. Um, and the trust metric, like we talked about a little bit, is, is subjective. Uh, you know, Trustix has no... It doesn't force you to think, like, this package is safe, this package isn't. That's up to you to figure out uh, which builders you're listening to and what your conditions for security around them may be. Um, you know, obviously, we should absolutely head for 10 out of 10, 100% reproducibility all the time if we can. But again, we're operating in an adversarial environment where that may or may not be true. Um, yeah. OK, so the next part, right? So how does this project, what are the kind of the building blocks that, that went into this, right? Um, as a builder, so imagine that you're trying to set up a builder, what do you need? Um, you need an XOS machine. Um, I should duplicate my screen, but uh, running, the, running the Trustix daemon. So you have a Trustix daemon that is simply uh, listening for builds on your machine. Uh, every time you build something, the post build hook is going to tie it into the, the Trustix daemon. It's going to add that to your build log and publish it. Uh, we'll talk about build logs in a second because that's interesting as well. Um, and uh, yeah, you're going to configure two, two things. You're going to need two different signers, right? So just like in a classic Nix cache, uh, you're going to have a build signer who's going to sign the packages that are built, and you're going to have a separate private key for uh, signing your build log itself. All right, so there are going to be two different authentication things you're going to need. And then you just build packages. Um, that's really it, right? Uh, it's one, here's, a, here's an example of kind of the, I'll move over here. here's an example of kind of the configuration and what it looks like. Um, you know, you have three services. So you have the Trustix daemon itself, you have the Trustix Nix build hook, and the Trustix Nix cache itself. Uh, the Nix cache is a wrapper around the Nix serve module, which if you're familiar with Nix, uh, it offers this ability to serve a binary cache on a server quite simply. Um, it's quite literally two commands, and you're able to publish packages and send them out, which is kind of nice. And Trustix just wraps this a little bit. Um, the build hook we just talked about, whenever you build a package, uh, Nix will pick it up and do something magic with it. In this case, it'll tell the Trustix daemon about it. Um, you know, one thing I want to point out is that, you know, the publishers, A, it's a list, so you can have multiple, but B, there's this uh, attribute that's protocol, and the protocol is Nix. So one cool thing that they thought about is that, well, what if the underlying package building protocol is not Nix? What if it's Geeks or something else in the future? Uh, you can actually use the components of Trustix with a underlying um, uh, protocol for building packages, which is, which is quite uh, a good foresight they had, I think. Um, append-only logs. So, yeah, we talked about these build logs. Um, you know, 
what's happening is essentially if you have the mental model of a blockchain, like you've already kind of got it. It's not a blockchain. Obviously, a blockchain is a subset of append-only logs. Uh, it's a linear log. You commit to the previous uh, entry in the log you issued, and each block or set of packages you're, you're publishing is a Merkle tree that has a mapping of build inputs, build outputs, and uh, the ones you have committed to that you've built locally on your machine. Um, you can always detect a rewrite. If you're publishing you know, your build log and all of a sudden someone as malicious as attacks this and decides to republish a certain set of packages, if you're listening to that build log, you can always, Trustix will tell you, hey, there's a, a fork here. Obviously, the, the, you know, the packages are now no longer the history that I saw before. Um, and if there is a fork, the packages before are still, quote unquote, safe to some extent. I won't go much further into this um, because there's a really excellent blog post by the authors and the tweet team about this called Good Things Come in Trees. Um, very cool kind of approach to Merkle trees. And I think if you're into this in Bitcoin, you'll, you'll see the familiar design, um, design there. Um, Finally, you know, while I was uh, setting this up and like working on researching this, um, you know, one thing we could think about is like at the moment you have independent builders that are publishing build logs directly to one client, right? So they're they're every single client has them individually. Um, but it would be really cool if there was a kind of system where you could publish it in a really censorship resistant way and broadly across redundant places and a lot of clients could listen to them and compare all the build outputs coming from individual builders. Well, this is kind of exactly what Nostra is, right? Uh, I could totally imagine there being a publisher that publishes through, um, has a Nostra profile, publishes through a bunch of set relays, and clients listen to the build logs from a variety of builders this way in order to really, really detect if there's any messing with the, um, the build log published by these publishers. I think it's a really natural fit, but uh, to be explored. Um, okay, so, you know, kind of wrapping up here, um, this project was, was built in the Nix space and really not in the, the the Bitcoin space, but I think this, the problematic that it solves is something that we're gonna want to, to think about uh, sooner rather than later. Um, you know, I think if people had any interest in, in pursuing this and, and thinking about what an architecture like this for package distribution might be, uh, I think like a, a solid MVP would be something like get four or five organizations in the space to run initial binary caches um, and Try it out. I mean, we already, it's just a Nix configuration I showed you, and a, you know, the, the example in the documentation is built with Colmena. Uh, I built one with Morph on, on DigitalOcean. Um, there's plenty of different ways we can figure out what the best way to do it is. Um, and then start building packages. Start building Bitcoin D. We have the package set from the Nix Bitcoin project uh, to, to, to use. And um, yeah, I mean, first, I think we should you know, analyze the reproducibility of those packages and, and see which ones are 100% reproducible and which ones aren't. I think there's gonna be a fair amount of work here. Either way, even if, it's, uh, even if it turns out that we have to look at the majority of Bitcoin packages and make them reproducible, that's a really good thing to know and a really good thing to work towards and something we should at least have some research done around. Um, and yeah, finally, I think you know, there should be some thinking around the, the client side UX of this. Like how do you engage with this arbitrary or maybe open set of builders? Uh, how do you look at your build logs? How do you deal with Nix packages in this kind of open environment? Uh, I think it's worth thinking a bit about, um, about the client, uh, client UX. Right. So yeah, um, finally, just some thanks here. Like the, you know, this project was, was developed uh, within, by a developer at a company called Twig. Um, if you've been in Nix or been around Nix, you've heard of Twig because they've contributed an immense amount to, to Nix over the years. Um, Addis Bladis is Adam Huzza, um, who was the lead dev on this project, and with a little bit of help from his team, has been maintaining it. Um, and I have to say, this project is just a great example of where Nix development makes your developer experience really outstanding. Um, super clean project, uh, really well organized. The docs are fantastic. There's protobuf definitions for the log API and the daemons API. Um, I think if you wanted to explore this, you'd walk in and it'd be a pretty amazing thing. So, you know, this was not an obvious thing to see as possible, um, to really like have the knowledge and awareness of Nix and then go and take it to the next level to think about what this might look like in an open architecture takes 
uh, a little bit of a genius, I think. So um, big shout out to, to him and, and his team for, for making this thing real. Um, it was funded in part by the NGI Zero project, which has funded a ton of next work as well. It's a European Commission project around the next generation internet, Zero being their security oriented um, project. Um, and yeah, that's where the repo lives. Um, you know, if you guys have any interest in this kind of uh, thematic and figuring out publishing packages in an open setting, feel free to come and chat with me. I'd be, I'd love to, to jam on this any further. But uh, yeah, that's it. Further questions? Yeah. Um, so have any security issues, ha, has this detected any security issues? Like have, have you found, like through Trustix, have, have you found like, hey, this is malicious. Are there any like examples of that? So, far, um, that you know? so have I found any malicious examples through this? Not really, because I've kind of uh, set up some toy builders on my own and kind of run the same packages that are already reproducible. So it's like, that'll just work. Um, I think that's something you really can detect. I think we really want to detect this in a way more, um, in a way more open setting is where it becomes useful for detecting malicious packages. Uh, in this case, the first thing we're going to detect is packages that aren't reproducible, in which case that's you know quite straightforward, and Trustix doesn't really help because every single builder you have is just putting out different hashes, and that's not very uh, helpful. So um, no, I haven't really. Yeah. Yes? How do you keep one Trustix node from perhaps gaslighting the others, um, submitting the, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> What, the others, deviation. sorry? Um, gaslighting. From gaslighting but, the others. But okay. it, it would just be a deviation. They wouldn't reach quorum. They wouldn't reach quorum. Um, yeah, so I mean, there is no notion of consensus in this environment, right, which is interesting. Um, how would you, so ideally, like all the builders are operating independently, right? And they're not just like sub taking in others' packages and republishing them. Um, that is an attack vector, though, right? You could imagine like a, a Trustix node that is, uh, that is um, providing packages, and really it's just taking packages from another node and republishing them with the same hash, right? Um, you can imagine an attack like that, I suppose, yeah. Actually, I'm just gonna comment on that because <clears throat> if you have a gaslighting node, Trustix node, then that, um, for anybody who d insisted on the, I, I want all of my Trustix nodes to agree, that does become a denial of service vector because now if I can just get any one gaslighter in there, everybody who has that policy on their end stops being able to use those packages or at least the upgrades to those packages until the, the gaslighter is identified and removed from their configs. So that's the threat model, not so much of, um, of running on trusted code, but rather denial of service for what would otherwise be trusted code except for the gaslighter. So. Oh, yeah. And Just a thought. No, no, very interesting. Because so it, um, it, it's more like a, a denial of service, more like they all take on the fake hash and. Uh, no, any one hash. If your threshold is they all have to 100% agree, then any single one. Oh, I see what you're saying. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I got becomes, you. Becomes, yeah, it becomes but, like the U.S. Senate. It <laughs> becomes like the U.S. Senate. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and again, like that's, that's kind of why it's up to you to figure out what your, A, your builders are. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's no, like, there's no mystery here, right? There's no protocol that is going to make you sure that you're getting the right packages. There has to be a number of set of builders that are actually building the packages and actually producing the hashes and uh, in good faith. And hopefully the amount of packages you're listening to are uh, acting in good faith and not trying to DDoS, right? I would still yeah. rather not get builds for a little while while we found and shot the perpetrator of a node that was doing bad builds or sucking up malware or something like that, totally then totally I awesome. would to have to recall all the stuff that got built that was using bad code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, I think, you know, Trustix uh, brings to the surface, conceptually brings to the surface a lot of these issues that could happen. Um, they're better than knowing that they're happening than not knowing uh, that they're happening at all, like it's happening today, so. Ruzol. 
Um, hi there, just to uh, see if I got the high level picture correct. Um, so a builder doesn't need to provide a complete cache all the time, right? So it, it's basically just for the build logs would be enough basically, right? To be a valid builder I can add to my uh, list. Oh no, you would absolutely want uh, each builder to provide a, build, uh, a cache. But w this would kind of limit the, the amount of builders because that's, uh, cache seems quite intense in, in, in infrastructure providing um, like uh, bandwidth or uh, server capacity. So I cannot have somebody just running a Raspberry Pi basically also being a builder I'm adding to my list because I would be just interested in his build log, right? To, to see if he can reproduce the, uh, the same hash and, and just to check on that. Um, that would be the valuable information. Um, so of course it's nice to have a lot of caches I can choose from, but basically I would also prefer having a wide list of builders, I can just check on the on the hash. So is there at the moment a possibility to run a builder just for the build logs and not f without the providing the cache? Yeah. So you just do nix cache, enable equals false, done. You're not serving packages anymore. Um, okay, okay, cool. However, yeah. no, this is, I mean, I actually hadn't really considered this, but you're right that you could have your little Raspberry Pis just building the build logs and proving that these packages are reproducible. Ideally, this is like we get to a place with packages where we know whether they're reproducible or not, and it's like moving forward, they're reproducible con in a day. So I, I didn't see like a whole lot of utility around small builders not providing a cache, but providing a build log. Uh, in my mind, it was much more you'd have actually, yeah, uh, it, it's, high, it's more intensive infrastructure. Running a cache is, is uh, hard work, um, and you have requirements that are important. So in my mind, it was more like we'd find a way to uh, you know, zap these build caches and, you know, uh, pay them for the service they provide, which is uh, providing packages. But uh, that's a good idea as well. I had not thought of it. Maybe this is so obvious uh, that everybody thought about it before, but uh, when I provide a cache, I provide a kind of download from my server infrastructure. Have you thought about um, torrenting this on a more like peer-to-peer -peer basis so nobody has the own uh, hassle of uh, a full cache but just provides packages because he downloaded it just right now um, like, like keat maybe a more modern version of torrent <laughs> yeah 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 no uh, good question why not torrent so i think um the problem with torrents is that you build it once and then everybody seeds it. And so they're really just copying the file around and they're not rebuilding it themselves. And I think part of the, the, the thing that's interesting about, um, about Trustix here is that you have multiple people rebuilding the thing and proving what they got out as a hash and then you can choose where you select it from, right? So the, the fact that there's multiple work being done here in independent silos is a feature, not a bug, right? Whereas in torrent, the architecture is more like build it once, pass it around, you know, whatever. Um, I'm sure people have, have thought about this further than me, but yeah. Um, as a builder, is there something uh, that, that protects me from malicious build scripts with Nix pack packages? Um, no, you, I mean, you get to choose what packages you build, right? Um, so you are, you are choosing the Nix package expressions you're using. So if you're sourcing them from uh, the Nix packages repo probably, or a different repo or whatever, that's up to you to figure out. Obviously, you know, if you have your, your fork of Bitcoin D that is a slightly different build script uh, or Nix packages expression for Bitcoin D, it's gonna result in a different hash, right? So uh, that's up to you. Like, so I think one of the things that maybe that is uh, useful is like Nix packages, we think of the cache and we think of the packages, but really it's a Git repo full of Nix expressions, right? And uh, it's a big library of how to build the software, right? And so I think this is an asset. You have the one, like the canonical build script for Bitcoin D that everyone can and should use because it's the reproducible one, the one that produces the same package every time. Um, so I think everyone should probably try to use the quote unquote canonical ones, all right? Yes. To the question of can I protect myself from what I'm building, you still have the options of running it in a VM or in a container to the degree that you feel that those are appropriate protective models against your threat vector. So you can run, for instance, you could run Trustix in a VM or in an NSPAWN 
you know, container. Totally. So totally. that should be pretty easy. Anyone else? Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Julian. Thank you, Julian. All right. Um, we've got about five minutes until we're running a little ahead of schedule, which I think is great. Um, Carl, if you want to come up and start getting set up, you can go for it. Um, we'll take like a, I don't know if any people want to get, maybe this is a great time to grab some more coffee, get a snack, and then we'll get started in about five minutes with Carl. Uh, who's going to be talking about uh, Nix OS deployments? Nix OS deploying with Nix OS, which is great. Um, thanks, y'all. Thank you. This is this is really nice. Nice venue, everything. Yeah. Yeah? Yes. Well, this is kind of short, but I don't know if that. Yeah, there we go. Okay, perfect. That's perfect. I'm good. Maybe I'll grab a water or something. But I want to make this work first. Okay, perfect. All right, is that, is that? No, that's not working. That's not. Oh. Um, so, um, uh, oh, do you have, can you give me some water? Do, Oh, 
Okay, okay. Cool. What? Perhaps, yes. But I think for 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 what it's good for. For what it's good for. Hey guys, we're gonna get started in about uh, 60 seconds. So make your final coffee runs, grab your seat, and then we'll uh, give it over to Carl. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right. OK, um, so thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, the name of the talk is different from the one on the placard, and I'm sorry about that. But um, you know, it's the, the dark arts of NixOS deployments, but a uh, more apt name is just you know, tidbits and rants of NixOS from, uh, from Carl. Um, so you know, who am I? I'm, I'm Carl. I worked on Bitcoin Core for three and a half years, and uh, you know, I, I exited last year to, to work on consulting and all of those things like that. Um, but that's sort of not very relevant. What is relevant um, is that I'm, I like operating systems. My, my, my idea of a fun time is installing Plan 9 on unsupported hardware, you know, nine front actually, not, not. Um, and, uh, and I guess my claim to fame for ha perhaps in this, this crowd is that, you know, I, I wrote the Bitcoin D service for Nix PKGs, uh, the first version of it. Um, and, uh, uh, and yet I, I understand that Nix Bitcoin has a better version of this service. And I also found a bug in this particular service a few weeks ago. So if you're having troubles, let me know. It's a one line fix. Um, anyway, uh, and, and, and also uh, I worked uh, when I was at Chaincode Labs on Bitcoin Core's build system security. Um, and so I, I, I moved Bitcoin Core from a, a Gitian uh, build system over to Geeks. Uh, and Geeks is basically supposedly a, a next generation of Nix written in Guile and everything. It's the, 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 the sweatshirt that I'm wearing. Um, and actually it's, uh, it's uh, main maintainer, um, a previous main maintainer, Ludovic, is, if you look at the Nix repo, the second or third most prolific contributor to Nix before he started Geeks. Um, so Geeks was very good for um, bootstrapping things from a minimal trust, trust base um, to you know, a full compiler chain that's able to do C++ and everything, um, but Nix is very good for deployments and everything like that. So I'm here, I'm here to talk about um, NixOS deployments. Uh, and I think one thing that I want to stress is I think NixOS is great for servers. Uh, and, and what I mean by servers is not you know, physical machines or anything like that, although of course you can do. What I mean by servers is um, long running services, right? So uh, any of us who've you know, uh, run our Linux boxes have all had that experience of you, know, you have this Debian or Fedora or, um, or Arch box that you've been running for three years and you, every time you touch it, you feel a little more dirty, you know? Like there's just one more thing in Etsy that you've touched and modified in a particular way that you forgot to document and now you have no idea why your system is acting the way it, it, it is and it turns out you've installed, I don't know, open resolve and, you know, resolve conf and they're, you know, clobbering each other. I mean, that's, 
That's just my life. I've done that five times, I think. Um, I, I think that, you know, NixOS is really good for, for solving that, right? Now you have this, you know, one thing that you have to look at, um, and, and it's good. And I, I also think that it's really good for servers in, uh, in a way such that, you know, using NixOS for servers and using NixOS to orchestrate services is really using NixOS for what it's good for. It's not good for, uh, this, is, this is a mistake that I see a lot of people trying to introduce other people to NixOS does, um, is, you know, oh, just install it on your laptop. Well, you know, you tell a guy to install it on their laptop, you're going to run into, oh, um, that, you know, laptop, man, you know, gigabyte cheaped out on their wireless use this like killer card from like 2005 with no firmware support and you have to do non-free or whatever things like that but if you if you use it on commodity servers like supermicro or, or anything like that or run it in a kvm slice now you don't have those problems and you can just get to what you know um, nixos is really sweet for what it's good for yes um and so you know for the first um, part of, uh, of deploying NixOS is, of course, installing NixOS, and I've got absolutely terrible news. Nobody supports NixOS. Um, and, uh, 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 VPS uh, providers don't have first-class support for NixOS. It's not one of the logos you can choose when you spin up a new machine. Um, and also, those who did have support are actively dropping it, because I am guessing people are running NixOS unstable and submitting uh, you know, customer support requests to their team, and they just drop it. Um, so absolutely terrible. Don't do that, please. Um, so how, how do we get NixOS onto, you know, I'm on Vulture, you know, maybe you're on DigitalOcean or, or something else like that, right? How do we get it into um, those machines? Uh, there, there are a couple of ways. Um, <laughs> One way is uh, NixOS Infect, and NixOS Infect sucks, uh, and the author of NixOS Infect says so. It, it literally says in the readme that if you use this, you'll probably brick your machine. It's because what NixOS Infect does is basically you download a script uh, that somebody else wrote uh, and try to replace your file system in a very particular way and reload system D in a very particular way um, in order to boot into something that works like Nix, uh, NixOS. Um, that is very terrible, very fragile, and of course that, that script doesn't work half the time. Um, and so d don't do that. Um, the second way is to have custom ISOs, right? Like all these cloud providers, you're able to uh, upload a custom installer ISO, boot from that, and sort of go from there, how you would install it normally on a computer, really. Um, and for that, I would recommend you guys look into NixOS Generators. Um, NixOS Generators is a really good project, uh, part of the Nix community umbrella. By the way, I love the community umbrella uh, stuff. It, it makes sure that things are somewhat well, well, um, well maintained other than NixOps, but that's a different story I'll tell in a few minutes. Um, uh, NixOS Generate is uh, really powerful. I mean, it can generate images for you know, Amazon, Azure, CloudStack, whatever. Uh, what I usually do is I generate and install ISO um, just because I like to you know, have, have more control over things, and you can install and, and, and a good thing about generating an install ISO, a custom install ISO, a custom install ISO is that you can generate an install ISO with your SSH key pre-installed, right? So you don't have to do the dance of, I'm sure everybody's done this dance of, you know, booting from the ISO and then having to go to your particular cloud provider's, you know, view console thing and then log in via the virtual terminal and then change the password and then start open SSH and then you can go in and install, right? So being able to have like a, a your, your own custom install ISO is really powerful there. Okay, so what, what's, what's number three? Um, number three is sort of the, the, the dark arts, and, and I, 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 this is sort of something that I discovered and I, I really love. And number three is um, k-exec. Um, what is uh, k-exec? Um, so I, I don't know if you guys know the exec command. That's part of the POSIX standard. So the exec command says, um, okay, I want to execute this 
uh, this process with, with these args, but I want it to basically replace myself in the process tree. Pretend like I don't exist anymore and that I've just been replaced by th this child and I want it to inherit all of the file descriptors. I think it does inherit all of the file descriptors. Um, what kexec does is basically it's like exec but for a kernel, um, which is really powerful in ways that, that I'll show later. Um, a, a way to think of it, let's say, is that you know a, what we do what we do reboot, or if you're a Leonard Pottering fan, system D reboot or system control reboot, um, is you know we, we, we unload everything, right? Unload everything from the user space up all the way up until we don't have power anymore. Um, and then we restart and reload everything back, right? So from the BIOS to the UFI to the bootloader to the kernel, to PID1, to user space, to everything else. Um, what we do with kexec is we don't reload everything. We just unload until we have, we're at the kernel, and then we reload everything back. So that, that's really helpful um, for, for, for a bunch of stuff where you can have faster iteration, basically. You can reboot without rebooting. You can clear kernel state without, um, without you know, having to power it all down. Um, uh, and, and actually, there, there, there's, another, there's another tool called Soft Reboot. Um, this is uh, from System Control, System Control Soft Reboot, um, that actually does sort of just, just the last two. But kexec is, is really the powerful one here, right? Um, and so, what kexec is really good for is two things. You know, one thing I just that I was just talking about was installing NixOS, right? Um, being able to use kexec now means you can you know, boot into a Debian image, right? And you can kexec now into a NixOS installer without needing to worry about, oh, does, does, my, does my box support Pixie or does it support Netboot or does it support something else? You can just kexec into the installer uh, and install it. And that's sort of the better way to, to, to do almost everything, right? Um, and another thing that kexec is really useful for is to have of your generations, right? Um, one thing that I don't, I think a lot of people um, perhaps misunderstand or, or, or don't, 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 don't fully understand is that um, a NixOS, uh, sorry, NixOS rebuild switch, uh, what NixOS rebuild switch does is it switches to the next generation, right? But without kexec, it can't switch to the next kernel version. So you're basically having this kind of uh, 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 you're, you're stuck in this weird state where your user space application at this new new level, but your kernel is still an old, at an older level, right? So you actually have to reboot in order to have the newer kernel. So what you can do is you can just kexec, and you would have the new kernel without having to reboot your entire machine. Um, and uh, NixOS Rebuild actually has a flag called NixOS Rebuild Boot that says, um, don't try to switch to the next generation, just line up the next generation in your bootloader such that the next time you reboot, it becomes a new generation. And, and that's probably a safer way to iterate, right? Um, and, and these, so, so you, you might be thinking, okay, so w what does it matter if there is a, a a uh, misalignment between my user space tools and the kernel, and it, it does matter. For example, um, I think back in uh, 5.09, I think, is, is, is when the kernel added the in-kernel um, uh, WireGuard implementation, right? Um, and of course, you know, the, an upgrade past that line and before um, led to a lot of <laughs> a lot of confusion, right? Because past that line, now you have WireGuard built in, and it expects WireGuard to be built into the kernel. And before that, it was completely in user space, and that led to a lot of breakages in in NixOS stuff. Um, so, okay, so using kexec in, in, in practice, I, I hope that you know, people do use kexec in practice. Um, I, I think you know, it's really good for things like um, you know, IP tables, like things like IP tables where you have kernel state that you want to clear. Uh, I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm terrible with IP tables. Um, and I, I always just add rules that I forget about later and, or, 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 or I, I make a mistake in my rules and I forget you know, what's the exact dash D invocation to clear this. Um, and uh, what I do is I just 
k-exec. I just k-exec and it's like a reboot without having to do a reboot, finishes in three seconds, uh, and now I have a sort of a clear uh, picture of what things do. So on UEFI systems, um, NixOS uh, defaults to the systemd boot bootloader, which is a really simple bootloader that I hope everybody uses. Um, and the systemd boot bootloader implements what's called the bootloader specification. Um, and uh, you know, uh, you know, the free desktop people always need, you know, always need to name things like it's the only thing in town. Uh, but it, it's a, it's a good, it's a good, it's a good specification. Um, so the 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 system D boot bootloader uh, is. It works really well with NixOS because every time you call NixOS rebuild, it actually talks to System Debu and tells it, "Hey, here's the new generation. Here's the next generation that I want you um, to boot to." And so, whenever you do a rebuild and build a new gen generation, System Debu knows about that. And now, when you do System Control K Exec. It will ask System Deboot, hey, what's the next generation that you want to boot to? And System Deboot will give you it and it'll boot to the next generation. So that works really well on UEFI. Now, if you're on a BIOS system, and you most likely are. If you uh, don't know if you're on a BIOS and an MBR system, you can, you can check it pretty easily. But, but if you're, you're probably on a BIOS system if you are uh, in the cloud, uh, in a system that you didn't configure, uh, things like that, right? Because, um, you know, it, 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 QMU machines don't default to UEFI, unfortunately, which I think they should. Um, if you're on a BIOS system, then you can't run, or it's very hard to run system D boot. You need something like Refined or something like that that emulates a UEFI. Um, so you probably use Grub as your uh, bootloader, which sucks. I've, I mean, gr I, uh, anybody who's touched Grub and its, and its shell scripts will know that and it kind of sucks. Um, so I think a, actually a, a fantastic um, uh, hackathon project, if anybody's up up for it is integrating NixOS Rebuild uh, with uh, with Grub or with BIOS systems or with the uh, KExec command line such that KExec works on BIOS systems. It, it should be 10, 20 lines, but you got a spot where to point it, put it, I think. Cool. Um, and so with, with all these tools, um, there's a project called um, NixOS Anywhere. Uh, and NixOS Anywhere is very cool. Um, NixOS Anywhere uses um, k-exec, so if you just have a Debian box with an SSH connection to it, it will basically SSH into it, k-exec into a NixOS installer, and run your installation scripts, which is really cool. And it does, um, you know, the disk partitioning uh, with a tool called Disco. And you guys should all check out Disco. Um, Disco is very cool. You, uh, um, apart from having a great name, um, it also allows you to declare your um, disk partitions um, using a declarative Nix expression, uh, which is really nice because I, I feel like if you've installed enough systems, you know that like the disk partitioning and formatting is, is one of the um, most annoying parts, let's say. And I, I sometimes fat finger percentages and all that. Um, and also, uh, so it uses Disco, so it knows how to format all of the disks. Um, and this is just a tip from Carl, just maybe a more of a note to himself is uh, just, use, just use LVM. Uh, it's never worth it to write uh, uh, raw partitions because you're going to get the order, you might get the order of the root and the swap partition wrong and then you expand your disk and then you have to do the magical dance of how to swap them again so you can expand your root partition. Don't do that, just use LVM. The performance hit is negligible um, and, and, and you'll, you'll thank yourself uh, later for it. Future you, future you, yes. Um, the, the, um, so, you know, we, we've set up our machine, right? We've set up a NixOS uh, machine, so how, how do we deploy configurations? Um, and th this is sort of how I feel about deploying configurations uh, since getting burned. Um, I think I, I, I used NixOps for a while and then it was abandoned for a NixOps 2.0 that never happened. And now if you run the one point something branch, it's all, um, 
it's all insecure dependencies and everything, so nothing works. Uh, and then I've tried other things that try to do magic rollback and everything, and nothing really works. Um, and But this year, I found uh, my new love, and my new love is NixOS Rebuild. Um, and this was from this post um, uh, by Haskell for All, right? Very typical of a NixOS lover. Um, it, it, announcing NixOS Rebuild, a new deployment tool for NixOS. But I mean, I'm sure everybody has use NixOS Rebuild before, right? Like that's the NixOS Rebuild switch is the first thing that you learn in NixOS. Um, and what you can do with NixOS Rebuild is you can give it a flake. It, use, it works with flakes. You can give it a flake of your configuration and tell it to deploy to this target host and build with that target host. Uh, and with that, I know uh, it's, it's blasphemous. I'm using a Mac right now. Uh, I actually deploy to five or six NixOS Linux servers from my Mac. Um, I, it's, it, it works really beautifully, and it doesn't require installing any tool that might be mis, uh, you know, mis, mismanaged, mismaintained. Uh, and so if you have a simple configuration, this is really good. Just write a bash script that does this. Cool. Um, and the next thing I want to talk about uh, is systemd creds. Um, systemd creds is, um, is uh, mostly in a light of not like you should use this right now, but in that this is really promising and it needs like one little tweak and perhaps this is just me being idiosyncratic, but you know, this just needs one little tweak before I think it's really ready for prime time. So, so where did systemd creds come out of? Systemd creds actually came out of the NixOS, well, okay, well, let, me, let me give some background on why secret management uh, is, is sort of, a, 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 not a shit show, but a difficult problem in NixOS, let's say. Um, NixOS is all about declarative deployments, right? You declare everything, right? And, and this de declaration is world readable, which is, Great in terms of interoperability and everything, but terrible in terms of uh, in terms of secrets. Right? You don't want all of your services to be able to see all of your secrets, um, and so there there has been you know long-standing all of these all of the deployment tools I've talked about before. I mean, they use uh, different ways of getting secrets across, and all of them are broken in very specific ways. Um, and so NixOS, there, there was a general discussion in the NixOS GitHub repo about secret management uh, and Leonard Pottering, the, uh, 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 the maker of all your nightmares like Pulse Audio and System D, um, chimed in and he was like, okay, I'm just going to build this tool called System D Creds uh, and it's going to you know, solve a bunch of, bunch of the stuff. Uh, and it has some really cool, it really does have some really cool properties, right? Um, so, uh, in, in, in systemd creds, you're able to supply specific uh, credentials to systemd units because it's aware of the units, right? So, n now you don't have to do system, uh, system credential passing through environment variables because passing it through environment variables means that all of its child processes also get these uh, uh, secrets, which is perhaps not something that you want. You can actually mount secrets to the particular file system namespace, almost like a container um, of that specific uh, unit and not share with anybody else. Um, it's also designed such that it goes, uh, it, the secrets are mounted via RAMFS instead of um, tempfs. And RAMFS is one, a, is an, a file system that, that resides in RAM but cannot be swapped out, um, which is fantastic because you know, if you swap out your secrets from RAM to, uh, uh, to, to disk, then you know, you're basically leaking it. Unless you have encrypted, um, encrypted swap, I guess. Um, so yes. Um, right, and, and, and another cool thing about systemd creds is that its encryption uses a per host key. So it, it, it uses a key that's assigned to one host, and it also knows how to use the host's TPM if it's available. So for, for, for those of you who don't know what a TPM is, a TPM is basically like a hardware wallet for your computer, and it, it exists in most computers. Your, your, pro, your computer probably do ha, does have a TPM, and it has you know, fused keys inside um, where you can never get the private key on, much like a hardware wallet, right? So systemd creds knows how to encrypt secrets to that TPM such that um, you know, if that computer was destroyed or, or, or the secret gets elsewhere, it would be completely useless, which is, which is really cool. And it, it limits the risk of lateral movement um, between the hosts as well. Right? 
Um, so what, uh, uh, what, what's it like, right? Like how, how can we use this? How can we use systemd creds um, in NixOS? What, what's the adoption like? So systemd creds is currently already used in about, if you, if you just search on NixPKG like I did this morning, um, it's already used in about like 35 modules. Uh, different services are using them uh, mostly for uh, passing credentials between services. Um, and that, so you can think of it like, for example, you know, if you have a Bitcoin D that has like a cookie, how do you pass that credential securely to a, you know, C Lightning or an Electors or something like that that needs to use that credential, right? Um, and you know, the, from the from the NixOS wiki, they also have examples of how to use system D creds uh, in order to have Acme give uh, give. Open SMTPD uh, uh, credentials in the format and in the permission model that it wants. Um, however, I, I, I would encourage people to read this NixCon 2020 talk by Corfuri about how uh, system D creds can be a lot um, better, uh, especially when, in terms of you know encrypted system D creds. Um, uh, Right now, systemd creds encrypts uh, encrypts its secrets using symmetric encryption, which is uh, somewhat terrible. Um, it means that if you want to encrypt a secret to a machine and not between units on a machine, you want to encrypt a secret to a machine, you need to SSH into it, encrypt it, and then get it back and then put it in your config, which kind of sucks. Um, it, it would be much nicer if systemd creds implemented asymmetric encryption so you can have the machine key, encrypt it locally, and just deploy, right? Like that, that would be much nicer. And that's like sort of the only thing that I see that systemd uh, creds needs before um, everything is good. Cool. Um, so thanks everybody for, for, for listening. I've got uh, a, a lot of other extra facts uh, uh, and you can come talk to me about it and, and everything else. And I would love to hear questions, although I know we're tight on time. Thanks. Hey. So how would you compare um, systemd creds to, for instance, SOPs and Nix-SOPs, SOPS? Right. Um, I, I, haven't, I haven't really used SOPs because, you know, I, I think it, wait, it, um, is it the one that used GPG or SSH host keys? You can choose. Okay, you can choose, okay. You can yeah, choose, yeah, yeah. I, I, and if you're using the SSH, actually, it's going to be Age's support for your SSH ED25519 right. keys. I see. I, so I, I think I'm, I'm sort of uh, um, uh, perhaps a lot of people don't agree with me on this, but I think the systems layer uh, needs to have some layer violations. Um, and so I, I think this is why I'm, I'm somewhat of a fan of system, I, some system D. I, I know that I'll get butchered for this. Um, but uh, uh, I think the systems layer needs to know things about each other, right? And I think that system D creds know, can know about which unit is executing and which unit is requesting the things, uh, which allows for a higher level of security uh, than just sort of key-based stuff. Uh, like SOPs. So I, I, I would hope that this, this line of work continues and, and that you know, other, other distributions are interested in it, um, silver, blue, and, and all of those things, yeah. Anyone else? Hi. About the as, uh, asymmetric encryption in system decrets, isn't that the limitation of the currently used uh, TPMs or do current TPMs allow asymmetric encryption? You're, you're talking about VPNs? TPMs. TPMs, TPMs, TPMs. Yes, yes, yes. Right, right, yeah. Um, I th I th yes, there will be constraints by the, by the TPMs. Perhaps the, maybe the one point something spec doesn't have asymmetric encryption, but I, I think that there is um, work to, I think 2.0 does have asymmetric encryption. I have to check again. But I think there's a to do, there's actually a to do list item on the system D, uh, to do, a main to do that's like, okay, implement the new TPM uh, asymmetric uh, uh, you know, encryption thing, which somebody please do that. Yeah, so thanks.
Uh, talking about bare metal deployment, one thing that's maybe interesting would be like uh, firmware updating, or like we have what is it LVFS, and it'd be cool to say like oh here's this in an emulated uh, you know in a, in a virtual environment and all of those things right because like that that's like an additional state that's an additional impurity basically right like if you think about it in next additional impurity because it, it's not like you can make a NixOS configuration and then uh, you know, change the firmware and then be like, okay, well now this deployment is going to download, you know, downgrade the firmware of your hard drive or something like that. You know, that, that would be um, perhaps somewhat worrying. Um, so uh, a, a, a architecture I've thought about recently and, 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 and Jonathan, you've actually inspired me to do this is to have uh, Proxmox and then just run a bunch of NixOS things on Proxmox with, you know, Vert.io and IOU ring and everything, so it's performant, so. No, no, no. Anyone else? Cool. Thank you, Carl. Um, let's Thank give you. it up for Carl, yeah. Um, great. Cool, so next up, um, we're gonna have Jonas Nick, um, one of the core maintainers of the Nix Bitcoin project. Um, he's going to be talking to us about demystifying Nix Bitcoin, leveraging Nix OS for secure Bitcoin nodes. Um, cool. All right, let's hope this works. Ah, okay, that looks good. Almost there. Nope. Uh huh. And now we have to. Where is it? Oh, this one. Yes, okay, let's see if this works. Yes, it works. All right, um, great to be here. Really good to see that there are a lot of uh, Bitcoin people who are interested in Nix. Maybe there are even some Nix people interested in Bitcoin as well. I'm very much looking forward to the discussion and the talks and the hacks uh, tomorrow. And a big thank you to Lisa and the Bitcoin Plus Plus team for putting this together. I'm very excited. I'm going to talk about uh, Nix Bitcoin. What is it? How does it relate to NixOS? Um, what features does it have? What are the weaknesses? What is the vision? So let's start with um, to change this here as well. Yeah, let's uh, start with um, what is Nix Bitcoin? At least according to um, at least according to the README. According to the README, Nix Bitcoin is a collection of Nix packages and NixOS modules for easily installing full-featured Bitcoin nodes with an emphasis on security. Nix Bitcoin can be used for personal or merchant wallets, public infrastructure, or for Bitcoin application backends. Most people today, I think, they're using uh, Nix Bitcoin as their personal um, Bitcoin nodes. And, if you use it that way, it's somewhat uh, similar in the functionality as a Raspberry Blitz, Umbrel, Noddle, etc. Um, so at the top, you see a picture of a personal um, Bitcoin node of mine, a former personal Bitcoin uh, node of mine. Don't worry, I have a rack now. All right, let's go a little bit into history of this project. So uh, this guy is an absolute hero of Bitcoin. He is not that well known. This is Russell O'Connor. Among many other things he did in 2012, he prevented uh, the op eval soft fork being merged into Bitcoin by Gavin and Reason, which uh, would have allowed for infinite recursion and therefore DOSing the Bitcoin protocol and all the uh, Bitcoin nodes. Out of that, we got uh, P2SH instead. 
He's also uh, the reason, or one of the main reasons, why we have Taproot today. He uh, came up with this whole idea of this speedy trial activation method, and he championed it. He's the inventor of simplicity, and in 2016, he gave a talk at a Blockstream offsite about uh, NixOS, since he's a, uh, he has been a NixOS user for a long time. And uh, I looked at all these uh, lightning nodes in testnet, and I realized, OK, this is really annoying. Now I have to set up. Um, Bitcoin nodes again, I've set up a lot of Bitcoin nodes in my life already for liquid, etc. So maybe, is there, an, is there not a way to make this more systematical? So I set this up only once, systematically, and very nice, and then I can just reuse that. And then I remembered Russell's presentation, I thought, oh, maybe I should play around with NixOS a little bit. And then um, November 13th, 2018, I made the very first commit in that project. Apparently, I got uh, Bitcoin running. Um, so, um, I want to talk about a, a little bit um, about the contributors as well. So, the first uh, contributor was uh, Nick's Bitcoin Dev. He's unfortunately not around anymore, but he was really instru instrumental in shaping our focus towards this uh, privacy and security aspect. And another extremely important contributor, he's uh, still around today. Uh, if not the most important contributor, that's uh, Eric Arfstedt. He's an incredible software engineer, really reliable guy. I'm very happy that we have him. And uh, he's a, uh, a Nix wizard par excellence. Um, he showed me that there are levels to this uh, Nix game that I will never be able to comprehend. <laughs> I doubt it, I doubt it. Um, all right, and the, the first time we used um, Nix Bitcoin really in production was in this uh, game called Bitcoin Bounty Hunt. It doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately, but it has this, had this crazy game, uh, crazy incentive structure with lightning, and you could buy in-game ads, and one of them you see here, that's our Nix Bitcoin logo. And that's where we kind of used Nix Bitcoin for the first time in production. Um, so, in order to get a sense of what uh, Nix Bitcoin users think about uh, Nix Bitcoin, I went onto Twitter and looked for a few tweets. So, for example, found Nix Bitcoin org recently and it's really cool, quite different from any other Linux distro and package manager I've ever used, but damn clean. Tried many node setups, but Nix Bitcoin org is the one that best fits my needs, highly configurable with security by default, and maintainers are very helpful. Send a small donation to the BTC pay server and we'll continue to as I keep value from the project. Set up a Nix Bitcoin node after listening. It's a bit more technical than Raspberry Blitz for OS setup IMO, but feels more minimal locked down to only what I enable. Definitely need mempool module though. Uh, Nix Bitcoin org is an awesome integration of Bitcoin Core, Liquid, Core, uh, Core Lightning, LND, and Tor. After Bitcoin Core, Nix Bitcoin is the most important project in Bitcoin. I think that's a bit of an exaggeration, to be honest. Uh, reproducible builds and deployments, exactly what we should expect from all nodes. So why is it damn clean, configurable, secure by default, minimal, and reproducible? Well, one reason is that these are the values that the contributors find important, but it's also one crucial reason is that we built this whole thing on um, NixOS. So we've talked a lot about NixOS already in the morning, but just as a reminder, here is sort of a short description of NixOS from the NixOS docs. So NixOS is a Linux distribution based on the Nix package manager and build system. It supports reproducible and declarative system-wide configuration management, as well as atomic upgrades and rollbacks. Although it can additionally support imperative package and user management in NixOS, all components of the distribution, including the kernel, installed packages, and system configuration files, are built by Nix from pure functions called Nix expressions. Um, so they mention system-wide config management. So how does that work in practice, at least for uh, Nix Bitcoin users? So you have some configuration.nix, that's a text file, and uh, there may be other text files that are important, uh, imported, and then you use the Nix tools to take this configuration and deploy it on some infrastructure. At least this is how most Nix Bitcoin uh, users use this. 
how does such a configuration dot nix looks like? Uh, Stick gave an example of it earlier. So ignore. Do you see my cursor, by the way? No. <laughs> anyway, ignore the the syntax and the details. You see, there are some imports. It imports a hardware configuration. It enables OpenSSH. It sets a custom port for OpenSSH, and it configures. Um, a hidden service or onion service for OpenSSH. And then you run NixOS rebuild switch, and uh, hopefully if everything, everything goes well, you will have these things enabled on your machine, and only these things. So it's very easy, relatively easy to see what is currently going on on a system by just looking at the configuration.nix and the imported files. Um, so why is this cool? The whole system configuration is just a few text files. They can be kept under Git version control. So you have a history of what you've done. Um, you can easily deploy a configuration to a different machine. We've, we've talked about that as well. Uh, Nix expressions, they can be checked for well-formedness, which is really nice. If you make a typo like this, where the port is not really a number, then you will get an error at build time which is pretty early compared to what often happens otherwise, where you start the service, you see it doesn't work, then you need to look into the logs and figure out what went wrong, whereas here you have a type checker who helps you figure out these mistakes early and thereby reducing uh, the time for this feedback, develop, debug, feedback loop. Um, so let's give a little uh, demo of the configuration.nix for uh, Nix Bitcoin. This and here we are. I hope that's visible. Okay. Uh, all right. So um, again, ignore this. But you see, there are some imports. So it imports a secure node preset from uh, Nix Bitcoin. And um, what this? So this file is the example configuration file that we ship. So if you install Nix Bitcoin via our installation tutorials, you will have this file, and it tells you to look at these uh, fixmes. So we have to look at those fixmes and sort of address them. So for example, here it tells you well we use this uh, hardened kernel preset, and it uh, imp pretty significantly impacts your performance. So turn this off if you don't need it. Um, bunch of other stuff. It tells you you can enable modules by uncommenting their respective line. Bitcoin D is enabled by default via the secure node preset. Um, all right, so now if I want to set a custom option, for example, this prun pruning option, I can just do this. And uh, I can also add additional options. They are all defined in the, in the respective module. I can set uh, T, turn on transact TX index, so like this. Um, bunch of other things. The C Lightning is uh, enabled here. Um, it does not, by default, accept incoming connections. If you want to do that, you have to enable this option. And um, then it will also s set up a uh, Onion service for this, so your um, your Core Lightning node is not available through ClearNet if you enable this option, only through uh, Tor. Uh, you can also enable plugins. There's LND, which you can enable. Can enable. There is Write the Lightning, Electros, Farcrum, BTC Pay Server, Liquid, Hardware Wallet stuff, Lightning Loop, Lightning Pool, uh, Join Market. As a backups module that you can enable, NetNS isolation, we're going to talk about that. Here's another fix me, so you probably want to fix your, to set a custom host name. You also probably want to change your uh, OpenSSH, this, uh, this thing to your actual, open, uh, to your actual, actual SSH public key. Um, and here you can add some packages that you need in your system, for example. <laughs> and yeah, that's that's mostly it. Then you can uh, deploy this. You run. Um, basically, we explain how, then how to deploy this uh, to an actual machine. <clears throat> All right. 
right, let's get back to the presentation. Oh, nice. Um, all right, we've talked about these things, but one of the most important things, to me at least, is this concept of abstraction. Uh, the configuration is not just some text file, as you've seen. It's written in a powerful language, the Nix language. And that means that we can use abstraction. We can write reusable software components, like modules, with that have clearly defined interfaces, and they can be connected together. And to understand the context for why this is useful, uh, we start with this example. Um, so assume you have a Bitcoin node, you have a Bitcoin daemon uh, running there uh, on localhost, some port, uh, you have a lightning daemon uh, running on localhost, some other port, and you have a lightning wallet. Uh, these are all different processes. So what you want is that the lightning wallet talks to the lightning daemon. Usually it does that by connecting uh, to localhost port M. But what the Lightning Wallet can also do, it can try to connect to the Bitcoin daemon. There's no reason to do that. It's a Lightning Wallet. It should only talk to the Lightning daemon. Um, maybe your Bitcoin node is set up such that it requires a, a password or whatever, and your password is strong. Um, but ideally, what we want is that the Lightning Wallet can never connect to the Bitcoin daemon or anything else that is on your system, only to the Lightning daemon. Um, so the solution to that is to put every service in its own so-called network namespace. This is a Linux kernel feature. And um, what this means then for the services, it looks like they are all on sort of different machines even that are not connected at all. There's no cable, there's no switch between them. They are just like separate network interfaces. So we need to build an internal router that connects these namespaces. Um, so we have a bunch of services, we need to connect them, uh, and the risk is that we end up with spaghetti code, because uh, it's, we have all these different requirements, this might end up with unstructured, hard to maintain code, uh, architecture resembles a tangled pile of spaghetti in a bowl, and we don't want that. Um, the problem is that there is this inherent relationship between security and complexity. We might want to increase our security by adding these various rules to our system, who can talk to whom, etc. But this increases the complexity by using the Nix programming language and abstract away this complexity. We build simple components with clear interfaces and we use these components to solve our problems bottom up. So this is an obvious concept for programmers, of course, um, but it's not that well known in the context of infrastructure as far as I know. Um, so we have a Bitcoin module, it talks to a network namespace um, module, it also talks to a Tor module that's responsible for managing the Onion services, it has some system D hardening component, it talks to a secrets module that's responsible for managing secrets like passwords, and it itself exposes some functionality um, via RPC and the Lightning module then connects or uses this RPC functionality. Um, so to summarize, we try to manage the complexity and then hopefully end up with a secure system instead of spaghetti code. Of course, spaghetti code can still happen, but um, at least we can try. It would be impossible to do if we were just dealing with uh, text files, essentially, and did not have a programming language. Um, okay, let's talk a bit about um, reproducibility. So we've seen this before. We have this configuration.nix, additional text files. We use the Nix tools. And they also dependencies um, for us. And the whole system configuration, including one, points to a directory that represents our current system. And um, the format for the files in this uh, Nix store is that first we have hash of dependencies, starts here, x, q, w, h, something, something, and then we have the name of the thing. And we can now start try to follow, um, follow, the, follow this further down. So what we can ask the Nix store, what does the current system depend on? Well, we see it depends on uh, Linux 6.1.52 and some Etsy thing, whatever that is. 
So we follow that Etsy thing further, la la la, and then we finally find, okay, it depends on Bitcoin D 24.1. What does Bitcoin D depend on? Well, it depends on glibc, gcc, minipnc, blah, 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 blah. Um, so we always know exactly what is running on our system. And this is great because it helps with debugging. We know what's on our system and it also helps with identifying potentially malicious dependencies that we have on our system. Um, we can also build all the dependencies from source to avoid trusting binary caches. Julian talked about uh, Trustix earlier today. This tries to solve this problem that we have these binary caches that we need to um, trust. Um, I'm gonna talk about later why this is not that great. Uh, but what's important to know is that we won't necessarily produce the byte-for-byte -byte identical binaries as everyone else. So there is this uh, sort of different terminology that's uh, floating around the NIC space and the Bitcoin space. In the NIC space, reproducibility means that if I build some sort of package, then I will always use the same sources to build it and the same dependencies. Whereas in Bitcoin, when we talk about reproducibility, we usually mean byte for byte, or uh, byte for byte, reproducibility in the sense that it produces byte for byte identical binaries, um, which uh, Nix or Nix packages um, don't necessarily do, but uh, actually they almost do this. So 99.77% of the Nix OS minimal ISO are already uh, binary reproducible. Um, so what the, the updates do, well, they essentially replace the run current system symlink and nice thing is Nix Bitcoin users, they all have the same packages as long as they're on the same version and uh, that makes updates less likely to break because they pro presumably didn't tamper with, um, with their system manually. And um, files that are not dependent on after update, we know who the, uh, what those files are and they can be pruned. So we don't have old software running around. Um, all right, the Robex feature was talked about also today. So this is, uh, you're greeted with this screen if you, um, when you boot NixOS or some version of the screen, I think it's a very old version. Um, uh, and um, what it allows you to do is to boot from previous configurations. So anytime you run this NixOS rebuild switch command, it will add an entry here. And if something goes wrong, you can reboot and then use one of these older configurations. So uh, this gives you a peace of mind when, up, when updating. All right, so that was the whole NixOS block. Let's uh, talk a little bit more about Nix Bitcoin, some, some feature highlights. Uh, we have this uh, run tests shell script that uh, basically runs our uh, test framework and it runs so, these tests in a virtual machine. And if all tests succeed, it means that it's a bit of an exaggeration, but that Nix Bitcoin is ready for release. So if the tests run, then it is very unlikely that uh, something extremely bad breaks because our tests, they're pretty thorough, they test a lot of stuff, and that helps us making uh, rather rapid uh, releases. We don't have release candidates or something like that. Um, all right, this shell script is a bit more powerful because we can also run custom tests or test scenarios. So this is the most um, complicated one that we have, presumably. Uh, that's the C-Lightning replication test scenario. What it does, it, it starts two VMs, uh, Core Lightning or C-Lightning running on one of them and trying to replicate all the state updates to the other one. And then later we check whether that actually worked. Uh, you can also run commands inside of a container that runs Nix Bitcoin. So here we start uh, the Bitcoin D scenario. We run the thing in a container and we run a command, Bitcoin CLI get info. And um, since this runs in a container, it's really fast, 1.5 seconds. Um, and you can test custom test scenarios. Now, it's, now it gets really interesting because um, here, so, this uh, scenario that we define here that was used in a pull to uh, review a pull request. 
Uh, it enables C Lightning. It sets C Lightning to a custom port. It uh, accepts. It sets. It makes it such that C Lightning accepts incoming connections through uh, Tor, and it sets the external port to 9735. And then we run the command Lightning CLI get info, and that shows uh, that everything has worked. Um, you can build really, really complicated test scenarios with that. And this really, really, if used correctly, this really helps with uh, reviewing PRs, for example, because this makes bugs reproducible for us, um, which is usually pretty hard in infrastructure. And um, you can just check, okay, does this scenario x slash Nix Bitcoin can be run on any Linux machine that has Nix installed, doesn't require Nix OS, it requires Flakes, I think. And um, what it does is it starts a VM with NixOS installed and uh, Nix Bitcoin. So um, if you are a Linux, uh, get um, some feeling for how it is to work inside a NixOS system and also run Nix Bitcoin in that system. Um, and you don't have to clone our repository or, or anything like that. Uh, but we also have examples in our repository. They are a bit more powerful, so this would start a, also an in interactive VM, but um, the advantage would be that you could give it a custom configuration to play around. We also have a production-grade example, and that is nixbitcoin.org. And nixbitcoin.org, its configuration is fully open source on GitHub. It hosts the nixbitcoin.org webpage. It has a custom BTC pay server powered donation page. It has our matrix home server. It's a flakes based configuration and um, it follows best practices. Uh, now let's get into some of the security features, uh, some system D hardening options that are interested, interesting even to non NixOS users. This is, should be interesting to any system D uh, users because this is really, really powerful. So for our, our default process configuration gives um, every process or every service a dedicated user um, as far as that's possible. And then there's this protect system strict option that makes it so that the file system is mounted or almost the full file system is mounted read only. And then we just selectively allow which directories or to which directories this particular service can write. Um, in this case, this is just the data directory using this read write paths option. Uh, we deny any IP by default, any IP communication except to localhost. Um, why do we do that? We do it uh, as a defense in depth mechanism. If there is some, so we want that um, Nix Bitcoin is private by default. And um, we do this such that even if there is some sort of misconfiguration, uh, case. Um, so in order to communicate to Tor, uh, through Tor, you, the service just needs to talk to localhost, which is pretty nice. We enable Tor by default and we have some more fine-grained controls to turn off, to turn on or turn off Tor and, um, or, and or run ClearNet in parallel. Uh, we have a, a bunch more of system D hardening uh, options that we use, uh, in particular this um, network namespace path if, if this uh, NetNS feature is enabled, which it is not by default. Uh, some best practices for Bitcoin D hardening. So Bitcoin D has this concept of a whitelist. And uh, so you can set a whitelist for a particular user, and that means that only the RPC commands in that whitelist are going to be accepted. Everything else uh, is going to be rejected. And what we do is we define an RPC user we call public, and that is only allowed to use read-only commands. It's useful, for example, for BTC Pay Server, because BTC Pay Server needs access to um, Bitcoin D, but um, using this public user, it can only access, or it can only run read-only commands. 
it doesn't have to access the wallet. So even if the BTC Pay server is um, compromised, it cannot access uh, the Bitcoin D wallet. Uh, we also have a relatively well-defined and well-funded uh, security bounty fund. It's a two of three multi-sig. It's um, pretty special in that it covers certain dependencies of Nix Bitcoin, even if they, so it covers certain dependencies of Nix Bitcoin if they don't have their own bug bounty program. So if they don't, then it's covered by our bug bounty program. Uh, no payout so far in the 18 months since uh, inception, but um, I would definitely support uh, if more people want to look at this and try to claim this, this reward, as long as they do it uh, responsibly, of course. Uh, we have this concept of extension modules. So it's uh, possible to extend Nix Bitcoin with modules that are maintained outside of the Nix Bitcoin repository, and they have their own review and release process. And uh, the reason for this is that it removes the reliance on the Nix Bitcoin maintainers as gatekeepers. You don't need to convince us that it's worth merging uh, your module. Um, and an ex uh, a module could start out as an extension module and thereby prove that, it's, uh, that it works and that it, there's demand for it and then it could graduate to a proper uh, module. And this extension module feature, this extension module feature is such that um, extension modules can use the Nix Bitcoin libraries, they can use the, our modules and they can hook into the Nix Bitcoin test framework and be tested within our test framework. All right, uh, let's get to the weaknesses. Um, and uh, the main weakness is that uh, advanced configuration requires knowing Nix and learning Nix is hard or even very hard. So if you follow our guides and if you just turn on and off our, the options we provide, then I think it's uh, pretty straightforward to use uh, Nix Bitcoin. But as soon as you do anything out of the ordinary, it can get hard very, very quickly. And that's why we call Nix Bitcoin the low time preference choice among the, among the node um, distributions. Uh, somewhat aligned to Bitcoin philosophically, you have to make an investment now and hopefully uh, you will uh, reap the rewards um, rather long in the future. But we claim it's worth it. Um, another big problem, I can only give a high overview, a uh, very high, high level overview of this, is uh, supply chain integrity is really insufficient. So assume you, you have your uh, Nix Bitcoin node running and uh, you receive updates from the Nix Bitcoin project. They are signed by me and your node is um, automatically verifying these signatures. Um, but uh, for all the packages and modules that we do not maintain, we receive the updates from the Nix packages. And um, as, you see, as you've seen in Stick's graph, uh, it's a giant repository which, with tons of people who have commit access. It must be in the hundreds. I don't know actually what the number is or how to actually figure out what the exact number is. And um, this is great to keep the packages up to date and add new packages, but security-wise, it's a bit of a problem. There are no signatures or anything sophisticated. A malicious committer could just try to add malware, and hopefully he's caught while doing that. Um, I have some heuristics, some automated tools to try and detect uh, malicious changes to software, but it's uh, very, very... Um, there are holes in this, let's say it like that. Uh, I don't want to go into it. Security by obscurity. Um, all right, and then the other problem, binary cache, Julian talked about it. Um, even if you get, if the sources the nodes get and the, all the derivations, if they are fine, most nodes download binaries from some centralized uh, binary cache and a malicious binary cache could just uh, serve you malware. You can build from source, it's possible. I do this, but this breaks the builds very often. You would have to use this uh, substitute equals false option. Why does this break? Well, it downloads something from the internet. It downloads a lot of stuff from the internet, and the internet is very unreliable in keeping stuff 
uh, at URL. So sometimes you just get a 404, the thing that is not there anymore, or the person who originally up uploaded this also updated it, which um, uh, changes the hashes, and then you have to manually check what's, what's going on and review this. So unfortunately, this breaks way too often. Um, I think this, my optimistic take is I think these problems can be addressed, like the Nix community has really, um, is really large these days and a lot of people care about exactly these problems. And um, it's also great to see that the Nix community is growing and I hope uh, we can make progress on this. For example, Trustix and uh, there are a lot of other proposals in this space, hopefully improving the Nix documentation, maybe, um, I don't know, chat GPT assistants will be able to help you much better in writing proper Nix. Um, it already helps me quite a bit, to be honest. So uh, what's our, our vision? Our main priority is to keep Nix Bitcoin up to date with patches, minimal low maintenance, reliable and extensible. And if you refer back to um, the tweets I showed in the beginning, this is also uh, what the users want. Um, we are also open to adding new packages and modules for new software projects uh, under a few conditions. So a new dependency, of course, shouldn't have a crazy build system, make it not too hard for us. Uh, there's reasonable demand from users to add it. There's a reason to believe that the new dependency is being maintained in the future. Um, and um, this is almost the most important condition. There is a reliable volunteer who maintains the new Nix Bitcoin uh, code. Because there are some people, they want to add stuff to Nix Bitcoin and then they, uh, they vanish and they will never look at this particular code again and then uh, we have to deal with it if something goes wrong. Mm. Uh, Nix Bitcoin is highly customizable and extensible. Um, so my approach, at least, is not to force it into a certain direction, but rather see how it's going to be used um, and then react to that. So, for example, there's been the talk for a long time that maybe someone makes a user-friendly node distribution that's uh, based on Nix Bitcoin, that adds some graphical user interface, something like that. This Nix Bitcoin would be suited for such a project. Um, all right, some, some short-term goals since there's uh, the hackathon tomorrow and also maybe to give you a taste on what we are working on right now. It's like we need to improve the Nix Bitcoin installation tutorials. Um, people use these tutorials, they install their nodes and then they ne never need to look at it again, which means they get out of date and they're not as great as they could be and we are missing a lot of the, the modern stuff uh, that you could actually do to simplify this. Uh, we need a proper logo. Uh, we need to add Signet support that's highly requested. Uh, we have a PR that adds a mempool module. Um, maybe add something new like a Fediment server module. That would be nice. I think uh, Nix Bitcoin is well suited for that. And uh, that brings us to the end of the presentation. Uh, you can find the slides at uh, nicola.ninja slash slides slash 2023. PTCPP, PDF, uh, that's all I had to say. Thank you. Well, we had about five minutes for questions, if anyone's got any questions. Uh, you, you mentioned that you use um, the user and group options in your systemd profiles. I'm just wondering if that was a deliberate choice and what do you think about dynamic user? Uh, yes, it was a deliberate choice, but I don't remember the reason for it anymore. Okay. But that was a long, uh, rather long time ago, but yeah, what, what you're referring to is this uh, dynamic user concept, right, where like systemd automatically creates a home directory also and like uh, dynamically sets up a user. I don't remember exactly why we don't do that, but I, I suppose it has reasons. Pretty sure. Sure, okay. Wait for the mic, please. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you can just go to nicola.ninja slash slides if you wanna check out the slides. I'd a like bunch of more slides. 
I've been handed the mic to say it louder. Uh, thank you for being the first pre uh, presenter who actually gave the URI for the slides. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, hi there, thanks very much for your work. Uh, can you give us a quick uh, high-level view how you manage the data, like all the data all the services are using, how they survive an update, if I update services, and how does it work if I go back to an earlier kind of configuration of my system with a lower L&D, for example, and then my data already has migrated to a kind of higher version. So how do you handle those kinds of situations? Uh, I think the mutable state works exactly or relatively similar to a normal Linux system. So we have these data directories, a, a dedicated one for each service, and um, that's where the mutable state lives. And um, the problem that you refer to when you say, okay, there's this problem that you update um, something and it will update a... Uh, a database, it will do a database migration and then we will try, you will try to go back to a previous configuration and now the database has already updated, right? That's the problem you, you refer to. And there, I, I'm not aware of a solution to this. So Nix, as far as I know, Nix doesn't help you with that. Jim? Oh, okay. I think he had a, a response. To the degree, uh, remember that Nix Bitcoin does supply some scripts, some infrastructure for helping you maintain your backups, which is actually pretty flexible. So as, as any sysadmin knows, before you do upgrades, you're going to want to back up your, your database schema and contents so that you can roll back the data in cases where that is not enabled by the software that you're doing. So... More or less, that's a place where you'd use your backups, is my opinion. Yeah, makes sense. Jonas, um, I know there's, a, there's an, um, an issue open on the repo for making options more discoverable, like uh, NixOS has the mm. search slash, uh, slash options that allows you to see all the options in a package. I wonder if you guys had any ideas of how to, whether you're interested in making that happen or... All uh, right, so... Um, I'll give a bit more context. I showed you the configuration.nix file and uh, there are very few options already there and um, uh, there are very few options but there are much more options that we actually support. How do you know which options do we support? And the fastest method for me at least is to look into the source code and look at the options that we define. Um, now the question is how can we make this more discoverable? Uh, I think the, um, I'm, is that issue still open? <laughs> okay, okay, because um, I think you, it works now. You, it should be possible to search um, through this, uh, using this search.nixos uh, thing, this online search to search through Nix Bitcoin options. At least it worked at some point, maybe it broke. Uh, but what we, what would be preferable, in my opinion, is to just have a man page for it. Like there's this uh, man page for uh, NixOS options in general, and it's very, very useful. You can quickly search through it. I want the same man page for Nix Bitcoin. There was some work on it. I don't remember. It was some time ago what, what happened there. But ideally, we would have a man page. Online search sucks just for finding options, I think. Uh, my question is just like how many um, do you plan on like upstreaming anything to Nix packages or is, are most of the hardening stuff like too opinionated for mainstream audiences? Um, I think the modules are not really well suited for upstream. Uh, the packages may be, but uh, I don't. I'm I'm not sure. I mean, it, if there are people who want to maintain the Nix package in the Nix package repository, then I'm I'm happy with removing it from from Nix Bitcoin. Let's say like that. But I'm not going to do it myself. It seems easier for me to maintain the packages in in Nix Bitcoin. Just to, to follow up on that, um, does Nix packages have modules? Like, could 
like, would it even be theoretically possible to just move Nix Bitcoin into Nix packages? Uh, Nix, uh, the Nix packages, yeah, they have modules. They have. I showed the Open SSH module. There are tons and tons of modules. But uh, the Nix Bitcoin modules, I mean, they use the Nix Bitcoin libraries and the Nix Bitcoin functionalities, like this Onion Service Manager, the Secrets Manager. They are pretty Nix Bitcoin specific. I think it would be quite hard to to untangle this. And uh, I don't think there's a big advantage to adding it to, to the Nix packages. I don't feel like having a giant repository has some advantages, but it seems like there's at least some effort to try to spread this out a little bit, this big repository by this Flakes, for example. Make, make it so that it, you can compose uh, expressions much better than you could today and not only rely on this single Nix packages, which is like this giant repository. Um, so if we're going to be, so to add something like Fetty Mint, for example, so we've got like, uh, we've got it, so there's a Nix package for Fetty Mint. We've also got a flake. Like, mm -hmm. is Nix Bitcoin opinionated in like what a better way to do integrations is, if I wanted to add Fetty Mint, for example? Um, so, uh, but what w would be nice to add to Nix Bitcoin would be a module, right? And we could just use the packages that you provide or the flake or, or whatever, but a module that uses then the Nix Bitcoin, Bitcoin D, and uh, maybe allows you to also set up a Lightning Gateway and uh, stuff like that. Anyone else? Great. Thanks again, uh, Jonas. Thank you. Give another round of applause. For... Okay. Cool, so we currently are scheduled to go on lunch break. I think that the shops to get lunch are gonna open in about 10 minutes. I think that's right. Maybe they'll be open a few minutes. I think we're gonna open up these doors so you guys can get outside. Right after lunch, we had a, we had a small change in the schedule. Um, after lunch, we're gonna go into our first Nix workshop. Um, Chris Guida is gonna run that. So what we're gonna be doing, yeah, Chris is here. Um, Chris, do you wanna come maybe give a few notes of things we need to set up over lunch and get some organization going? Um, I think the general idea, I'm sure Chris will fill us in a little bit more, but the general idea is that we're going to be using virtual machines to set up and run, I believe, Nix Bitcoin. We're gonna build Nix we're gonna build Bitcoin from scratch using Nix on a Nix OS that we have on a virtual machine for you. There was a small limitation though. Um, so we're gonna to need to make friends at your tables. I believe there's 10 tables here. Um, we're gonna be able to get 19 machines. So that means every table will be able to have two people that are running it. So make a friend at the table, figure out who at your table uh, are going to be running the virtual machine. So like, you know, two people at each table. And then we're gonna post out like a telegram in the telegram group. If you're not in the group telegram for um, today, it might be a good idea to get in there during lunch. Um, so this is a working lunch. You've got some tasks to take care of. So when we get back here at 120 on the dot, we'll all be ready to go. Um, cool. Did you wanna, is there anything else? Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much all. Uh, like, we're I'm actually gonna I'm doing something kind of crazy for this workshop. I'm spinning up DigitalOcean VPSs for. I wanted to do everyone, but I realized like an hour ago that um, DigitalOcean only gives you 25 uh, droplets unless you like ask for special permission. So I have 19 slots. Um, so just send me your name, and I will reserve you a VPS. And then you know try to like spread yourselves out among the tables and like let other people um, uh, participate. Yeah, like two per table. Yeah. Yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna hopefully just spin up like a whole mutiny net lightning network uh, in here from scratch using NixOS. So that's what we're doing after lunch. Great, thanks, y'all. Uh, yeah, we'll be back here starting at one twenty. Thanks. <laughs>